I'm pumped up. All right, everybody, here we go. All right, it says we are live. I think we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, guys, how's it going? Welcome to Caliber Corner, Season 3, Episode number 183, Podcast number 183. And today we've got a, a very important topic, which is the idea of building your own AR-15. Now, I'm not doing this video or doing this podcast as a way to, you know, create some kind of a panic. I mean, people think they need to go out and go invest in an 80% setup and make their own AR-15s and stuff. But we're just going to talk about the process, the ideas, the options that you have if you decide that you want to build your own AR-15. We'll primarily focus on 556. Uh, but as you know, you've got other options, AR-9 and, and so on. So before we do that, I've got an absolutely star-studded panel that showed up this morning. They got up bright and early to be here with us. So let's show them a little bit of love, let them introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started on the topic. We'll talk about uppers, lowers, options, how to maybe do it on a budget if that's possible. I might show off a few of the tools that I use. I'm currently doing a couple AR builds myself. And so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we got Mo Patriot on my left, Missouri Patriot. How are you doing today, sir? Good morning. I'm doing well. Right, right. You ready for today's episode? Are you excited? Are you browsing parts right now as we speak? I, I'm <laughs> not. Uh, okay. I have not... Uh put a put an a ar together myself so i just mm -hmm. figured i'd come in and uh, watch like everybody else sounds good sounds good and again there's a million you know how-to videos that are still on youtube that haven't been taken down yet i still refer back to those we might not get super technical with the actual assembly process but we're talking about your options maybe some pros and cons a couple pitfalls people fall into when they do their own builds and so on so missouri good to have you with us bud yep no problem all right awag 1000 in the house how's it going awag Kill, what's up? Thank you for the invite. As always, I'm always happy to be here. You know, I don't know if I can think of a topic that's more suited to your alley than the assembly area of the AR-15. So, <laughs> yes, you've done uh, mostly. You've done a lot of your own builds, right? Yep. Um, if if I don't have to buy it nine times out of ten, I will build it. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so yeah. that that goes from AKs, pistols, bolt actions. Uh, I haven't built a shotgun yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's probably farther down the line but uh yeah I've, I've built just about everything and anything that you can possibly think of i'm glad i got your expertise here i know other people on this on this uh, panel have put their own ar-15s together too but if it gets kind of technical or you want to chime in on any wisdom that you've learned from years of building uh please let us know okay all right well one thing that i'm going to put out Yo. there and i'm already yeah. going to make a bunch of people angry at me is please do not put a bad lever on your ar oh. because you're you're, you're, you're you're changing the operation of the gun and you're introducing a long piece of, I don't know if it's like metal or plastic. I don't even know what they're made of. You're introducing a long sliver of metal that could get caught on things, could get, you know, bent out of shape or completely jam your rifle altogether. If you get it caught on something bad enough. It's a possibility. I mean, the more stuff you tack on, there's a more potential for disaster, right? Correct. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Uh, Defense Dad, anything you want to say before we get started, man? How are you doing today? Uh, I'm here. I'm awake, sort of. So, should be fun. Right on, man. So, so give us a little little, little, little tease here. What's coming up on the channel, man? What are you working on? You got some range tests coming up or what? I got some range stuff. I got about four guns that haven't hit the channel yet. And I just got to nice. get me off my butt and do some videos. I've been kind of lazy about it lately. And I want to apologize for the peer pressure I put on you the other day that caused you to go buy what I bought. You son of a gun. <laughs> we are so bad for each other's financial health. It's not even funny. I, I mean, was telling my coworkers, like, you bought another gun. I'm like, well, it's not my fault. It's, it's, like, a, very, it's a destructive financial bromance yeah. is what it is. So They're yeah. like, how is it not your fault? Well, I didn't know it was there until my buddy called me and told me it was there. <laughs> and then you call me and you're like, hey, they got one of these in stock. Come look at it. And I go up there and I buy it. It's just not good. It's not yep. good. We're happy in the end, right? Sure. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, sure. I'll tell you when I get the. I'll tell you when I pay the bill off in thirty days. Yeah. There we go. All right, and also joining us from uh, the West Coast, we've got a little storm in Norman going on. Norman, how's your morning going, dude? Hey, what's going on, y'all? Every day above ground's a good day. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Hey, are you eating some of those mini pancakes for breakfast? Nah, man. They went out that same day. They went uh, out I'm gonna out send you some. I'm gonna get a package of them and send them to you. I'm gonna hook you up. Yeah. I'm building an AR-10 right now, so I'll be chiming in and out. Cool. All right. Good. Well, hey, we've got you and AY. We've got some firsthand experts with us. Uh, if there's any technical questions, I suppose, from people watching on the YouTube side, throw it out there. We'll do what we can to answer it. I'll try to keep an eye on the uh, comments while we're talking, and uh, and we'll go from there. So, all right. I'm going to stop you right there, Travis. Please yeah, do not call me an expert. 
<laughs> first hand experts. Well, yeah. and individuals. I'm, individuals not, I'm the... not one either. I'm not one oh, either. Oh, man. Yeah. Come on, guys. Hey, I, I, I always refer to. Um, night striker, I fuck I mean, whenever I mess with up, I say night, night striker, or a wag, get me out of this, somebody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not an expert. I'm just a 25 year, 25 year old guy that likes weaponizing things. Yeah, that's there. You go, there you go, including memes, right? <laughs> Correct. Of All course, right, cool. the memes are the most deadly. Absolutely, no, no other way can you sway more people than putting out a wicked meme. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. Also joining us uh, from the eastern side of the country, we got a little night strike going on. Night strike. Good morning. How you doing, sir? Uh, I'm good, and I will admit to being an, an internet AR-15, uh, you know, gun expert. We are keyboard commando gun experts. That's right. Yes. We are. We are professional PSA shoppers, is what yeah. we are. Yeah. Talk to Norm <laughs> all the time on the phone. Yep. 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 There you go. He, he does go. call me up all the time. It's a, but it's cool. I like Norm, so you know, there's no problem there. He's a cool dude, man. He's a good guy to have around and, uh, you know, knows what he's doing. So, exactly. Hey, it's always good to have somebody right down the street from PSA, especially when their online sales are out. <laughs> yeah. Getting yeah. good. Getting good. With I live sales. closer he than he does. Yeah, he does. He does. He AWAG literally lives like five minutes from PSA. I live about an hour. That'd be bad. That'd be so bad for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Actually, it'd be good. So I can't complain. We got a hey, lot so of good wait, 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 wait. You guys are near each other. Yeah. If you guys are near each other, that means night wagons coming out soon, or what? No. Uh, Sadly, I work. I no. work for the gun industry now. So he's I, got. I he's got a non compete clause. Yeah. Oh, man. Maybe uh, Storm and Norman could put together a line, and you guys could like maybe but, you know co license it or something. Yeah. I, 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 I am. I am working on it. There. There may be a strike gun works in. In the works. Ooh, Uh-oh. nice, nice. Cool. Yeah. You know, if, if, if I can swing it, I might make some custom AR-15s and call call them Strike 15s. Oh, there you go. S e r y k e 15s, right? Uh, no, Absolutely. or just or just NS 15. Ooh, there you go. I like that. Now that sounds like a gang. I don't know. <laughs> no. NS 15. No. Okay. <sighs> all right, all right, all right. Moving on, moving on. We got Squib. Squib, what are you doing, man? You got your coffee? You ready to rock and roll or what? He's got a bad connection. He might be coming back here in just a minute. There he is. Uh, we'll see if he can join us. Squib, you with us? Yep. All right, all right. So. Squib, we will uh, refer to you if we have some questions about putting one of these uh, together, any of these questions that we have that pop up. So, all right, man. All right. And uh, moving on, we got Single Shot. Single Shot, how's it going, brother? How are you doing today? Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, doing pretty well. Looking at a pretty nice day and start running southbound on I-75 in Michigan. Headed back towards the home location. So, uh, be over there probably Monday, Monday night. And uh, deliver this load. That and I gotta you? go for a couple of days. Going northbound on I seventy five in Michigan. I thought I saw What's you. That? I said, that, that that was you. We're northbound on I seventy five in Michigan. You are. Where are you? Does he know where he is? Oh, uh, his signal keeps bumping out. They should rally at the truck stop. They should. They should. They should meet at the pump and pantry. <laughs> the boss <knows. laughs> I'll meet you at the pump and pantry. I'll get you a taquito. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're going to get into it. Let's get the topic. Oh, actually, a couple things I got to mention first. We'll give a little shout out to the YouTubers watching here in a second. And uh, today's episode is sponsored by SS Pond in Lexington, Nebraska. I want you guys to go to SS Pond. It's in the central part of Nebraska, right off Interstate 80. Take a ride at the Lexington exit. It's right there. You can't miss it. It's got a big sign that says Pawn Shop. Stop in there. Say hello to Stan. And SS Pond will take care of your firearms needs. Okay, join us on the YouTube side. We've got the usual suspects. we got New York Outcast, Mystic Guns, G23. Mr. Cypher Monkey's out there. Good morning. Uh, says that he is listening whilst digging a fence post out of concrete. Oh, my God. That sounds like so much fun. Um, M. Gabriel's out there. Ozzy Orsborn's in the house. Watt 75, Justin Grimm, Defense Dad's over there and over here. Jason J., Snake Doctor 78's with us today, G23. Uh, Southpaw RX, Tennessee, gun guys out there too, and Jason Stewart. So here we go. Um, G23 said, yes, sir, I'll be having a live stream today. Make sure you guys check out G23's channel over on YouTube and subscribe. Subscribe to everybody on this panel if you get a chance that uh, 
that has a channel over there on YouTube. We have lots of great content for you. And I think we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, the topic that I post, I actually posted this topic, I think a couple days before Biden came out and made his declarations about whatever he thinks he's going to do. And uh, I just wanted to cover this topic because I'm in the process of doing a couple of AR-15 builds. And uh, there's some things I have done and some things I haven't done in terms of building. But I want to talk about it because a lot of people think that nowadays, you know, maybe you can save a little money if you buy the parts here and there and you shop around a little bit. But then there's always the option of buying stuff that's pre-built. So there's pros and cons to both sides of it. So we're going to start off just talking about the lower of the AR-15, the lower receiver. And I basically see it with an upper receiver and lower receiver. You've got three basic options. OK, so if you're in the market for a lower and you want to build one, OK, so you can go with as crude as possible, which is basically buy yourself an 80 percent receiver blank. OK, it's basically an unfinished lower receiver for an AR-15. If you buy that, there's going to be tools you're going to need to do it. If you have the tools, great. If you want to get the jig and want to get the specialty parts to finish that 80 percent lower, do it. Have fun with it. I've done them before. They're, they're really not that hard to do. They're a bit of an investment. You might not necessarily save money on your return, even in the long run. But if you want your own 80% lower, you know, definitely go that route and do so. And, uh, you know, some of the advantages to it is, you know, you can choose whatever you want. You can get one that's unfinished and then finish it yourself. So you can start off the 80% route. Well, the only bad thing about those 80% lowers is if you make any mistakes or nick a certain part or don't follow the directions or you try to hurry, uh, you're going to get something that's going to be crudely finished that might not function. So AWAG, what are some of the pitfalls that people run into when they try to mill one of these things out? What's What, what are some of the issues you run into? Because a lot of people are like, well, I'll just go make my own. And it's really not as easy as you think it is. Yeah. So basically backing up uh, before you even think about yeah. purchasing one, yeah. ask yourself this question. Um, are you roughly good at putting together puzzles, like regular, just little, like the little cardboard puzzles? You could put together one of those and you can take the necessary time to put together something more than a thousand pieces. Then you have the patience to potentially build one of these lowers. And the reason why I make that correlation is, like you said, is if you rush, you will mess up. And when you mess up something like that, because getting a lower is like, what, 80, 80 bucks? You oh, know, no, they're – well, at one point, I don't know what they bottomed out at because when I got into it, they were 70 and I bought about four of them. Um, and so now I think they're $99 is the buy-in price for an 80% blank is what we're going to call it. We're yeah. not going to call it a receiver because it's not a receiver. It's an 80% blank, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. just a hunk of aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing is, is you should have the correct tools to do it. And mm -hmm. by the correct tools – is normally they'll give you a list of like minimum requirements for tools. But if you look at it, these are specialty things that need specialty tools. Um, my minimum for building a, uh, or milling out an 80% is at minimum a mill because you have greater control of how much material you're taking out. So for those that don't know, don't know what a mill is, okay, it's a hand tool that you're going to hold that spins kind of like a drill, and you use that to hollow out the cavity to make your 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 space for your trigger pack, right? It's, it's, not, quite are, hand you know, it's not quite handheld. Well, it's uh, mostly like bench-mounted. It's, it's like a drill press, except uh, bigger and a lot less, uh, a lot less crude, I'd say. Well, it's, I'm using. I've been using the. I've been using the hand, the hand mill with the spacers and everything from the okay. company that I bought the whole set from, and it works just fine. It does work. Yeah, fine. you can you can yeah. do that. Um, yeah. and I have seen some of them turn out a lot, um, like really really nice. Mm -hmm. But you you got to take your time with these things. It's oh it's yeah, those, absolutely. We'll talk about the time investment here in a second. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're definitely heavy investments of time and. You know, at the same, like you're you're your own quality control. So mm -hmm. if you if you're the kind of person that likes to scoff at, uh, you know, like PSA lowers or Anderson lowers, and you know, I I encourage you try to you know mill one out. Go ahead, do it. You know, see how it turns out, and then you'll get a greater appreciation to, of you know the manufacturing that goes into the PSAs, the Andersons, that kind of stuff. My recommendation to you is if you're going to do this, get as much as you can from the manufacturer selling the lowers. And that's just because the actual bits that you use to drill through the metal, the tip that you're going to need for your speed mill, if you decide to use a hand mill or, 
your regular mill that you were talking about. You want to use what they recommend because those are, you know, industrial grade bits that are designed for going through metal. They're going to last more than one lower when you put them together. They're not necessarily cheap. I think a bit for my speed mill is $50 for a single bit. And then the actual, the, the three drill bits that you use to drill the holes for your trigger pins and your, your safety and all that stuff. I want to say those so, are 40, 35 or $40. You can buy the whole set for 60 from the company that I go through, which is 80% arms. Um, and again, none of that's given to me. This stuff's just all bought out of pocket. So, yeah. So one little tip that I can give you for building one of these is get, um, get the drill bits that you need for like all the holes and things, and then get a couple drill bits that are smaller. Um, and what that does is you're basically making a smaller hole than what's needed. So that way, when you go to do the final cut, it's a lot easier on your machine. It's a lot easier on your bits. It's it's just a lot easier to drill a pilot hole than it is to just go for the final uh, dimensions at once. You have a lot less chance of walking the bit. You have a lot less chance of snapping a bit. So what I want to say about that, though, is the one that I bought has a whole jig that bolts onto the 80% lower, and then it has the holes with the specific mm -hmm. bits that you have to use. So you don't have yeah. a choice, but I will say this. It takes a while, but it's not hard to do the pilot hole if you use the actual jig from the company because it keeps everything secure. There's bearings and bushings to make sure that the bits stay as straight as possible. But even as I told you before the show started, I still have a few issues with my lower, even though I took as much time in the world as I could on this last one. I really wanted to be careful with it. And I still have a couple couple small issues that mine ran into. So, yeah. Yeah, so if, if you can, um, definitely try to... Because with those jigs, you have your basically it, it starts starts it for you, but there's no there's no there's a lot of factors that go into drilling a hole that you might not think about. How much pressure you're putting on the drill, how much you know, what the material of the drill bit is, can directly influence whether it's going to walk or not. So if you make a little pilot hole, it's going to greatly reduce that chance of it walking. Yeah. Uh, John Z points out something here. And here's the thing too. John Z, John Z says, don't forget proper lube for drilling. I was just using WD-40 and that's worked good so far. I honestly could not find cutting fluid. I suppose I could probably order some online for milling or machining. I know you can make your own. There's a mix that you can make that you can do it yourself. WD-40 um, or motor oil will work just fine. I, and that's I used a ton. Me. So here's the thing also, you know, when they were saying, oh, you can prepare these ghost guns in 30 minutes or less. I couldn't using the speed mill and really trying to do it the right way. It took me three and a half to four hours. And you're going to say, how does it take that long? Well, you basically make one pass. You clean out the shavings. You got to wipe out the, the mess. You have to adjust the drill bit, uh, your, your mill bit. And then you got to go do it again and do it again. There's three different phases with the kit that I bought in order to get that cavity hollowed out. So it does take a long time. They have to stop and clean it. You have to flip it and drill it. It's not a 30-minute job, okay? Oh, 30 no, minutes maybe. Good. You know, if you buy a finished lower, you could maybe do a lower in 30 minutes if you know what you're doing and you rush, you know. The yeah. 30 I mean, minutes or less, they're referring more to the Palmer 80 Glock builds, I think, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand the plastic ones, but like an aluminum receiver, no, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, even minutes, on the website, have, they're like, oh, 30 minutes less. It's like, who the, how do you do it? I, in haven't, even, I haven't even seen a CNC machine do a lower 30 minutes. <laughs> it takes me 30 minutes just to set it up and get it ready to go. I mean, I'm not going to criticize it because it's, it's fun and it's a blast and I love doing it, but it's like, no, if you want to do it the right way, it's, it's, you know, you're not going to just go make it in the backseat of your car 30 minutes after you buy it at the store, you know, sorry, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I have a, I have a buddy in, in New Jersey that has a CNC machine. He yeah. has his own business. Um, and I've, I've watched him like from putting the like lower into the, machine and then pushing the green button it probably took like an hour yeah uh and that's, uh, a, that's a two hundred thousand dollar cnc machine oh god so. and, I, and i'm using a two hundred dollar speed mill you know <laughs> uh so snake doctor 78 said i'd milled out a polymer 80 percent a few years ago used a drill press with an xy axis clamp made it easy but i did mill out one side a little too much still works with no problem you have a little bit of space for mistakes but with these ar-15 lowers when you mill them out you know, you could over, you could, I don't know, overbore, I suppose, for your trigger pins, and then they're not going to stay in place, and you got to buy anti-walk pins. Um, my situation that I have on the one that I just finished is a safety lever that slides left and right about a quarter inch, or about, about a little under a quarter inch, and that causes just enough to block the trigger from functioning. So now I'm looking at getting myself an ambidextrous safety. So, I mean, yeah, it, it part of it for me is just part of the fun of trying to do it, just to see if I can actually do it. I'm not really 
you know, I, I don't know if this is necessarily going to be a go to war weapon, right? But it's one of those things where I wanted to try just to see what it is. Um, so again, you can go that 80% route, but if you do, I would recommend getting as much stuff as you can in a complete package to make it as easy as possible. If you don't have the experience or the tools or the bit sitting around or the know-how, you can follow the instructions and you can do it with no problems, but I'd recommend just getting their set because it makes it as convenient as possible. It's not the cheapest option, but it is something you can do. Um, another thing, too, is you have a lot of options if you get yourself an 80% lower. Uh, there's a lot of options for colors and finishes and engraving. There's a lot of companies making all kinds of different styles and types out there. Um, and so, you know, you do have a lot of options if you go that route. But you also have just as many if you go the next step up, which is going to be the stripped complete lower, right? Uh, is there anything else you guys want to say about the whole 80% lower process? Anything that you want to mention at all before we move on? I would other than just take your time, get the right bits. It's one. It's see with with the eighty percenters. If you get all the right tools and you get all the right, um, you know, the jigs, mm -hmm. the um, the drill bits, the proper tools, mm -hmm. you know, those will last you more than one, uh, you know, more than one lower that you build. Um, so you can basically maximize your investment by making more receivers for yourself. You know, yeah. everybody wants to, to build more guns and I just yeah. completed an AR-15. I'm already wanting to build an, uh, an AR-10 now. So like it's, it's one of those things that one, one thing leads to another, you know? Yeah. Uh, Justin Grimm says F1 Firearms has a FUBAR guarantee, one-time discounted price if you mess up. Yeah, 80% Arms does the same thing. I think you get 50% off a replacement receiver if you screw the one up that you're doing, so much to the point that it's not going to function. So you have that also. I'm not going to do that with mine because it, it, it's good. I just have a little bit of tweaking I have to do to mine, and it's going to be perfectly functional. So um, Snake Doctor says, I had my safety slide from side to side. For some reason, the message got retracted there. I don't know why. Hmm. He was mentioning that his probably because we're talking about fire manufacturers, so YouTube's freaking out right now. So don't be surprised if we get this podcast shut down uh, and deleted. It's not monetized anyway, so I don't care. But um, anyway, yeah, so there could be little issues that you run to along the way. But again, some of the advantages are you've got your own. Uh, you know, it isn't on any kind of a registry. There isn't any kind of kind of check on it that had to be done. It's simply your own firearm that you can legally make. And, you know, it does make life a lot easier. So um okay so the next step up that we have is the registered strip lower okay you're basically buying yourself a lower that needs a parts kit to be finished and those have gone up in price quite a bit i defense dad and i we picked up a couple for about 45 bucks 47 dollars about six months ago i think now i want to say they're 75 to 100 dollars for a, a strip lower which basically again just needs a parts kit to be put together and that's basically it so, guys, why don't you chime in on this one? If any of you have ever done any kind of a lower build, what have been your experiences with these uh, strip lowers? So, strip lowers, honestly, just, um, you know, buy one that you like. There's really nothing wrong with the lower end because the lowers, they're they're only housing your stock and your, um, your trigger components. So, I hate when people get all bent out of shape where they're like, oh, you got PSA lower. Oh, you got Anderson lower. It's like, yeah, who cares? It's only holding the uh, the lower, and they're made to a specific specification. You know, and kind of redundant there, but um, you know they're made to a military specification. So anything that does not meet that specification gets tossed. So when you see uh, all of these these people that are like, oh well, this doesn't fit this, it's like that's that parts issue. That's not the lower receiver. I've seen how these manufacturers make these lowers, or at least the one in New Jersey. So, I mean, it's pretty much close to everything that's going on with Anderson and PSA, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's not going to affect accuracy at all. It, it all depends on the furniture that you put on it. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that people get bent out of shape for nothing. Um, the uppers, on the other hand, um, they are, most of your uppers are all made pretty much in the same place. Uh, there's only like three or four forger forgeries in uh, in the United States now. There used to be like five or six. So BCM, Aero Precision, Colt, um, all of their uppers are made in the same facility. So, you know, pick your poison. People that give Aero Precision a bad rap for some reason, uh, you know, 
it, there's no reason to get all bent out of shape for those those upper receivers. Um, now, the one that I would heavily gravitate towards is LMT because they do make their own forgings and um, their uppers are slightly like where the barrel journal, uh, the barrel journal, that's where the barrel goes into the upper receiver. They're mm -hmm. slightly undersized, so they're a lot tighter on the barrel. Yeah. And that will greatly improve your accuracy. Um, I'm mm -hmm. running a an LMT upper uh, right now on my uh, M16A4 clone that I built. Um, okay. But they're 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 upper they're stripped uppers are like 130 bucks so they're you're you're paying for it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, defense dad. Uh, I looks like Stormy Norman deal that. De defense dad, were you going to say something about the lowers at all or? Uh, so yeah, I was, I was just going to say just kind of like you guys talked about on the 80 percenters, just two things. Be honest mm -hmm. about your mechanical skills because if you can't put a screw in the wall straight, you probably shouldn't be manufacturing or building a firearm. Um, not that it's that hard, but uh, oh, you, anybody can learn and with the right tools. I'll show off some of the basic tools that I used to do in assembly. It makes it a lot easier that, you know, 20 bucks of an investment, your life is much easier in my opinion. But yeah, yeah. like I, I didn't go to gunsmithing school by any means, but I grew up building cars and building houses and that kind of stuff. So I have the mechanical skills to do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and just take your time. It, it just like anything if you try to rush it you're gonna you're gonna screw it up yeah yeah and i know that some people you know rag on anderson lowers i've i've built or you know assembled three um stripped you know registered complete well not not complete but you know like not not 80 percent anderson lowers never had any problems with them once in a while i guess the rear pin can be a little bit tight on them but that could also be a pin issue it could be an upper issue i mean it's not necessarily always on the lower um, there, there can be a little bit of a tolerance uh, difference, but they make these little nylon bu uh, bushes you can put in your lower that takes up the slack. Or personally, I like to buy the Anderson. They're called their Elite lowers. They have a tensioning screw built in to go through the handle that if you have a little bit of slack, you can adjust it like some on the higher priced ones. But either way, you can fix it, and they're going to run fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're yeah, good. That I mean, means, that'd yeah. Be, yeah. Um, the slot between the upper and lower receiver, um, that really shouldn't affect your accuracy at all unless it's like really bad slop that you're like, you're practically twisting it more than one degree, which is a lot more than what people think. Um, you know, then you should probably look at your upper or lower and get them replaced uh, yeah. depending on whatever it, it is. It can but, be just a little bit annoying though. So it, it's got a little rubber yeah. stop. You can put a screwdriver up there and you can tighten just, it if you have that slack. I just use layers of duct tape. That's all I do is I cut a little strip of duct tape, put it under the um, the lower receiver, the back portion of it, or the upper receiver, sorry. Yeah. And then I just keep fitting it, and it, it takes out the wobble. So yeah, it's, that it's a cheaper for like, alternative. For like two bucks, you can get that little dial-out insert that just sticks in the back of your upper. Yeah, it's always a possibility, too. Um, yeah, so, you know, when it comes, and then also, you know, we talked about things like your trigger pins. If your trigger pins start to come loose, you can get anti-lock pins for like $8 that you can install that don't move. They'll stay in place. They screw in on the side so that your trigger pins don't wobble out during, during use. And, and I mean, my, I noticed on my, my most recent, um, 80% build that the, the pins are just a little bit loose, but not too much. We'll see what happens when I actually shoot them. But I honestly, I'm just going to swap them out anyway. Seven or eight bucks, you know, save a little bit of money. I mean, in the end here, I'm not saving anything. Versus buying the uh, the stripped, you know, serialized lower, right? But I am having fun doing it. It's just kind of neat making something yourself. I've got no, like, machining experience prior to this at all. So this is kind of exciting for me to do something different. Unless you count using a Dremel to, like, you know, to get rid of tack welds and stuff. That's about the limit of what I had before. But, yeah, with a little bit of practice and just reading the directions ahead of time and taking your time, you know, anybody can basically build their own. Um, you know, more advantages to those those uh, strip lowers is you're going to have more of a guarantee on it. If something happens, you could always return it to the manufacturer if there's some sort of a manufacturing defect with it. Um, so now, anyway, tell me, what about the, the lowers? Are they only manufactured by so many forges in this country also or not? Do you know? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know entirely. However, um, you know, most of your lower receivers that are uh, built off of your military specifications, they're all for forged. If they're, if they're considered to be mil spec, they're forged. Yeah. Um, and most of the time, I would stay away from anything billet just because <laughs> of weight. Uh, 
because most of your billet stuff is a forged block when it comes to the manufacturer. However, they're taking more material off than if it was, um, you know, the forged general shape of the lower. And technically, they're heavier. And by contrast, they're somewhat weaker and for weight to size ratio. Okay. So, like, I would definitely go with anything that's a forged lower. Okay. Um, you would, you would, or you would not? I would. <clears throat> anything that has forged in it, go for it. Uh, okay. Because they're, they're probably going to be a little more expensive, but the manufacturing process of a forged component is much more durable and will last you a lot longer. Maybe do some research on a particular line before you buy it, though. Read some reviews and make sure they don't have any defects or any issues because you sometimes hear about cracking or poor metallurgy, especially if a company is just introducing a new line of anything. Definitely mm -hmm. do your research before you buy into it. Yeah, um, definitely, but, definitely go yeah. for the forged uh, aluminum flowers because it's been done for since like the, the 50s. Um, you know, they have that, that manufacturing down. So most of the okay. time. If it's if it's a defect, it's a defect for that specific part. Yeah. Now, like we're mentioning before, going the eighty percent route or going with a strip lower receiver, um, you know that's already finished, ready to go. Some of the advantages again, you can pick your own components. You're not buying it pre-made from the factory. You can take your time putting it together. Say you want to do a build, you know you can spread out that cost over time if you want to. If you don't like something, you can try something different. Uh, different string or different springs, different triggers, different whatever you want to call it, you know, bolt release levers and such. So you've got that option if you want to go ahead and do your own. OK, now the next step up is going to be or step down, however you want to look at it, I guess, would be to buy a complete ready to go, fully assembled, low receiver. It's got the stock on it, the buffer tube, all the components are installed, ready to go. So there was a there was a time before all this craziness a couple of years ago when you could save maybe 15 or 20 bucks if you bought the parts yourself and put together, you bought yourself a parts kit, you got yourself an inexpensive, you know, uh, strip lower receiver, put it all together. You could save a little bit of money versus buying one online. And then for me, I noticed it got to a point where if I wanted just the basic M4 furniture with a complete lower, say go the PSA route, right? Like $109 delivered with maybe a little bit of sales tax on the side, I could get myself, uh, you know, a, a complete lower ready to go. And then you can get the Magpul stuff for like 20 bucks more. So at one point, like PSA was doing complete Magpul, you know, assembled lowers for like 129 139 Now I think they're probably $100, $150 more than they used to be. <clears throat> they're just, they've, they've raised their prices. And so I don't know if you're necessarily going to save money now, but if you don't want to mess with the hassle or the, or the trouble, or you just don't even want to mess with it at all, you know, your other option, your third option is going to be to go completely assembled, ready to go which is what I've done primarily up until recent time. Yeah, Defense Dad. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, well, I just say to that, it depends if, yeah, if you're happy with just the standard furniture. But you can still save money now if you know you're going to go, if you're going to buy a complete one and you know you're going to swap out the fire and control group, you know you're going to swap out the stock, you can still save money by building your the lower yourself. But... I mean, if you're if you're okay with just a factory furniture, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like or, changing your own oil anymore. It's kind of hard or, to beat the price. Or you can do what I did, which is you can take the factory furniture off and sell it. If I knew I was going to put Magpul stuff on it over time, I'd you know buy a whole Magpul furniture set, sell the old furniture after like a year, and you can still make money off the stock, the grip, the trigger guard, stuff like that. Um, whether you want to sell it online through like Gun Broker, or, I used to be able to sell just stuff through Facebook, which wasn't an issue at all. Yep. Cool. So we have a question for the panelists here. Do any of your panelists 3D print? It's a great solution to making parts that are hard to find or that you want to customize. Um, I have used a 3D printer, but I don't own a 3D printer. So I can't, myself, I can't comment. Any of you guys have a 3D printer at all that you're comfortable sharing if you happen to have one or not? I, I it had, depends on the part being made. I had one in AWACH, right? It depends on the part. Depending on the part, you can make some parts that, that work great. But then you can try and make some parts that don't work great. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, finding the right material, making sure, you know, you you factor in the amount of shrinkage because when you when you print when you 3D print plastic, it doesn't matter what kind of polymer it is. But the problem is that it's going to have some shrinkage. It's going to shrink it's after being printed. Happens with injection molding too. Yeah. 
So you got you got you got to equate that in, in into your into your builds, and sometimes that means you have to make it you know you know a step or two larger, and then just sand it down. Yeah. So yeah, um, I then, bought. I mean, you, you, it, it is it is viable if you just need some cheap parts and you know they're they're gonna break all the time and you just want to you know print new ones that that might be a good solution but overall I would say if you can get metal parts get metal parts okay yeah I mean I've bought in off of eBay I've bought in uh, 3D printed grip sleeves for my pistols because they were relatively expensive and they were like the only available grip sleeves out there right. for extended magazines right. it's cool that people make them. There's one that I bought for my Canic TP9 uh, SC for my uh, extended mag, and it adds that back area that's cut out of the factory grip sleeve. And I like it. I mean, it's cool, and it's very durable. It's very firm. But obviously, you want to watch, like, what type of polymer that you're using for a 3D printer, the strength of that polymer, the quality of it, because you don't want something that's going to crack or break, especially if you're making components for AR-15s, if you're printing your own. You know, and let's say it's a part that could be printed. It still may not hold up, you know, durability-wise. It's something you could run into also. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at the internal comments there. Um, yeah, okay, so again, if you want to go the fully assembled lower route, that's going to be the easiest way to go. But if, as you know, you know, these are these are items that, that you'd have to purchase from an FFL or from another individual, may or may not be registered to you, and some people just aren't comfortable with that and they don't want it. So they'll go the 80% route and just make their own, which anybody can, you know, as long as you can legally own a firearm, you can make your own gun. Legally, it's not a problem. Well, for right now, we can't, right? Um, so anyway, that is another option. And my experience is I've kind of made my way back to the point of doing the 80% lowers, you know, started with complete lowers, swapped out some parts, moved over to the strip lowers, just added my own components and made my own. It's a really cool feeling when you assemble your own lower and then take it to the range for the first time and shoot it. It's like, oh, this is awesome. It's like, I actually did this, right? I, even if it's just installing the trigger pack and installing, you know, the minor components, it's kind of a cool feeling. And even more, if you go back a step and do the 80% route, you know, you, you put your own together, assemble it. For some people, it's not a big deal. To me, it's always been kind of a neat thing. It's kind of like, hey, I actually made this. It works, right? So that's what's fun about it. All right. Now let's talk about uppers. Let's move on over to uppers here. Uh, when it comes to your uppers, you've got three options. Okay, you can start off with a stripped upper receiver, which is just basically your shell, right? And then from there, uh, this is where, for me, I don't have as much experience. I've seen a million videos on putting together uppers. You know, you could assemble your upper in theory at your kitchen table with just a few simple tools, but there are some things that'll make your life a lot easier. Uh, AY, can you comment on the idea of putting together your own upper? What are we talking about here? Is this something anybody could do? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, one tool that is absolutely necessary is a vice. You need a vice. If you're going to build an AR from the ground up, that stripped receiver, stripped upper, stripped lower, uh, you know, and you get all the parts together and put it together, you need a vice. Um, whether you need the other tools like a, uh, uh, what is it, like the Geisley reaction rods, those are super, mm -hmm. super helpful. Um, the, uh, the, I guess the Magpul little like AR builders block that they have, that's useful too. Um, definitely need an armor's wrench or a, uh, what I like to call the Swedish nut, uh, Swedish nut stripper. Uh, or adjustable wrench for you folks that don't know what that is. Um, Here you go. You know, <laughs> um, adjustable wrench is necessary um, depending on what kind of upper you're building. A uh, armor's wrench, uh, a vice, a vice block, uh, and then the Geisley reaction rod is is optional. However, it just makes building these these yeah. rifles a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, I assemble. I always assemble from a stripped upper. Um, I almost never build from a uh, completed upper because, you know, it's one of those things that I like putting them together myself and I want the exact part that is going to go into this, this rifle. I've built countless uppers, built countless lowers, um, you know, so if you have any questions, just throw them out there. Uh, before we get more into the upper thing, I guess we can talk about some of the tools that make the lower assembly easier. I just showed off a magwell block, which makes it easy for you to just keep that lower in one place while you attach all the parts to it. Um, obviously, you know, some sort of a hammer, you're going to want that. Some masking tape so you can ma mask off certain sections so you don't mar your lower when you're putting it together. Uh, and then a punch set is always a good idea. Um, I just got a punch set from Harbor Freight a long time ago, basic flat punch set. And that works really good, but I've got two more specific set of punches I want to show you real quick and then talk about them, and then we'll go back to the idea of the upper. Uh, Defense Dad, what's up? 
Uh, I had a quick question for AWAG. Since I mm -hmm. since I never built an upper, do you also yeah so the try the idea of trying to make sure the head spacing to me is I've never done it. Do you need a set of gauges as well? Um, right. It would it would be helpful. However, um, you know, I hate putting bad info out there. Uh, head space gauges are really nice to have, uh, but nine times you know 99 percent of the time uh an ar barrel um and i have to specify ar barrel any other rifle that you're building whether it's a uh, you know a bolt action an ak whatever you need headspace gauges um when it comes to the ar you really don't need headspace gauges because they're all made to a military specification um and the barrel when it comes to you is already headspace so how an AR barrel is manufactured is they have the barrel blank and then they basically cut it to the rifling. They cut it to the contour of it, all the gas ports, gas box, that's all drilled and stuff. And then they put on what's called a barrel extension. That is essentially your entire chamber. That's your chamber and that's essentially your bolt lugs. So what happens is you can take that barrel and replace it with another barrel and you can run the same bolt and it will be just fine. It won't, you know, there's, there's no, and plus, even if you do have bad headspace, there's no way that you can change that. So most, most of the time you're going to send it back. Okay. Um, I but, just, since, since I hadn't bothered, I, I haven't done one yet, I wanted to ask, cause I'm used to building yeah. engines and transmissions and you use gauges for everything. Yep. Uh, I, I'm well aware. I built the, uh, I built the engine on my Toyota. So, um, sure. cool. But the, um, AR barrels, they're nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, they're all headspace correctly because they're built off of the specification. And I'm pretty sure when they are manufactured, they're checked multiple times because that's a liability well, of the manufacturer. We hope so, but in the age of all this rush, uh, rush manufacturing, but, but if going you think on, about it, if you think about it from a, uh, a there's liability if they don't. So yeah, yeah, if you look at it yeah. from a manufacturer standpoint, you know they don't want to put something out there that can potentially blow up in a customer's face, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make one, uh, one other point on uh, the lowers. <clears throat> There's a plastic block that's available that while you're working on the trigger assembly, whether it be yep. a mill spec or whatever, make sure that that plastic block is inside that mag well. Don't let that hammer slap up against that frame. Because if you do, you'll yeah. break it and it's a paperweight. So, this is just a little builder's walk that I bought off of Amazon. Uh, right. These were like ten, fifteen dollars. I've used it for numerous builds. It locks into your actual magazine release, so it doesn't go anywhere. So yeah, it's pretty easy to work with. Um, all right, now also talking about those punches, you don't have to have anything specific, but if these roll pins that you get, if you try to just hammer in the roll pins, they're going to flare out or flare in. You're going to ruin them, and it's going to make life not so much fun. And I'm sure you can work your way around it, but yeah, hey, don't mess with trigger guard. Don't even try it. Don't try it. Get an arbor press. I've already folded two. I ain't gonna be lying. <laughs> Get an arbor press. It saves you smashing on those trigger guards, and then you fold one of those lips. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Yeah. Just get an arbor press. Twenty bucks from Harbor Freight or wherever. I uh, I, I use I use roll pin uh, roll pin starter punches. Yep. Because that's what you really want to use for a lot of the roll pins that you use on the AR-15 receivers. So I here's the ones that I use, and I can I'll look up the brand. These guys are tiny. But they got little holes in them, and you can put your yep. roll pin yep. in it to get it set, and then just tap on the back, and this will work them in about a quarter of the way. So these little guys, these little guys are just a lifesaver. These ones were made in the USA. I'll look up yeah. the brand here in a second. But Travis knows where, where mine were made. They were made by Chinese uh, warrior monks, you know, in uh... <laughs> Wish.com. The Wish.com monster. No, 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 I didn't get that. I, didn't, I got them off of Amazon, but 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 again, they were you know made by. Uh, by, by Chinese warrior mucks. There you go. My <laughs> roll pin starter punches, if you want to get the ones that I use, which I've used them on about three or four builds, no problems. I have no affiliate link or anything like that. It's uh, squirreldaddy.com, and they're made in the USA. I got them. I think I got them off of Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, yeah, they were not that expensive. I want to say they were maybe $15. But I don't They might I be know, guaranteed guys, for they life, have starter but... roll pin punches. What's that? Oh, uh, Norman, you're cutting out there, buddy. 
We got disconnected. Uh, the other having connection issues. Then once you once you get it started, then the other one to go through. We've already mentioned these a couple times. The, your your roll pin punches. These are a little bit different from regular punches. And well, I'll grab one of the big ones here so you can see it. They have a dome on them here, and that fills that hole in the roll pin punch, and it evenly distributes the forces you're hammering them in, and that's going to prevent the pins from flaring out or flaring in. Those are proper gunsmithing punches. Those aren't those aren't yeah, the normal these... normal punches because there's a difference between a normal yeah. punch set you get from the, the yeah. hardware store and one specifically for gunsmithing. Yeah, well, these are just roll pin punches in general. You can use them for a lot of applications, but for your firearms, you're going to use roll well, pins, you know, quite heavily. The yep. ones that have the round edges like that, those are usually more for gunsmithing than they are uh, yep. regular hardware. These are Pro Tool Supply. I think I paid eleven ninety nine for these on Amazon. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. You spend twenty or thirty bucks, get a couple tools. They're going to make your life a lot easier. Even if you think you're only going to do one build, that was kind of my idea. I'm like, oh, I'll just do one. I bought some of these specialty tools. You know, it really made my life a lot easier. You save a lot of time, a lot of frustration. The lower looks better when you use the proper tools to put it together. And so that's that's why I'd recommend you go this route and get some of these basics. Again, you don't have to have them, and I'm not trying to to have you waste your money. You can get by without it, but they like, they make life a lot easier, especially getting a bench vice and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, Travis, Travis, yeah. have you got? Do you have the wrench ready? Uh, the armor's wrench. Yes. Yeah, I did show it off here a second ago. I I don't know what brand. This one was actually given to me in a tack back years ago. Yeah. I can't remember who made this one, but you can get. There's the Magpul Armors wrench, which is like seventy dollars. Um, I don't remember who this is. This is one of the companies that supplied yeah. stuff to tack pack about a year ago. You can My, get like a get an NC Star one for like fifteen bucks. But, I, I I paid forty bucks for mine, and mine's an, a, a, a DPMS uh, armor oh, wrench. Okay. Yeah, this is going to help you tighten that uh, castle nut but, on the rear when you put it together. It makes it a little bit easier for you. But I bought mine locally from a shop. I didn't actually go and, you know, okay. buy mine online. Okay, okay. Because it was now, easier you, that way. When you, when you buy that wrench, don't buy cheap. No, I this thing this thing weighs like three pounds, man. This sucker is heavy, man. It's like yeah. <laughs> it's, I have yet yeah, to actually bend it. it or bend any tabs on it or anything like that. I want to say it was like J&M Supply or something like that. It was a company I've heard of before. Um, but, uh, they're decent. So, uh, trying to see what's going on here. Oh, so DJ play nice says, is that AR floating back there on Travis P11's desk? W2F? No, this is the RNL designs AR 15 stand. If you go to RNL designs.com, you can pick one up. They're manufactured by our own, uh, New York outcast made the USA. Um, I did feature this in a recent video. This is the natural, no, this is the Woodstock finish, I think is what it's called. There's a natural finish you can get, and you can also get painted black ones. And uh, these were great. These are great. I've, I'm actually going to be giving one away for my uh, Patreon giveaway the month of April. So you have an opportunity to get one along with everything else I throw in there. So yeah, they're kind of cool. I was going to maybe get like three of them and put them all over the place, but I'm running out of stuff to set rifles. It's a, it's a bad problem to have. So, and I, I just absolutely cannot move the Gen 1 High Point 995. I mean, that... That has its own place. You know, that's that's old school cool right there. So I don't care who you yeah, are. Yeah, sit in the corner and don't touch it. Yeah, exactly. No, we <laughs> have to use it today, man. This it's is a, my, it's a high point, man. I traded my Jimenez J22 and 100 rounds of, of CCI mini mags and a little I'm, bit of cash I'm sorry, on the side. I'm sorry, but you 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 gave that J22 away. You know, Dude, so I, that I, gun the J22 has seen a lot of use. Yeah. That gun falls into the category of some things are just so damn ugly they're cool. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it's got the Planet of the Ape stock with it, is what they call it. Uh, this one was made during the assault weapons ban of the late nineties, and so this one, you know, um, the only bad thing about it is it came with a three eighty carbine magazine, so I had to order a nine millimeter magazine for it. I mean, I could probably use a three eighty one, but I didn't want to mess with it. So it's like fifteen bucks for a mag, but I'm ready to rock, man. I've got a red dot on there and everything. <laughs> Uh, cleaning video will be coming soon, so trust me, that's going to be a fun one. Uh, anyway, back to the AR-15 talk here. Um, let's get back, the, back to the uppers here, okay? Uh, let's see, so AWAG, he might have had to bail. Okay, so when it comes to the actual assembly of the uh, of the upper itself, you're looking at having to get yourself a gas tube, a gas block, a handguard, depending on which way you want to go. Uh, definitely like an upper receiver block. They talked about a reactor rod, which I think makes it easier for you to mate the barrel with the upper receiver. I haven't built an upper receiver myself, but have any of you guys done your own upper receivers before? Yes. Okay, anything special we need to know about? I mean, I was watching some of the videos. They talk about heating the end of the uh, receiver when you mate the barrel to it. And, and some people even said put the barrel in the freezer and heat the receiver so when you put the two together, they slide together better. There's a special grease you can use when you assemble those two parts when you put them together.
Yeah, you use, you use anti seize grease. Yeah, a little bit of anti seize, and uh, you've got to have something that uh, slides into the uh, bull carrier group section mm-hmm. of that receiver to hold that thing steady and brace it. Uh, I've got two two different tools that I use for that. Uh, one slides into the upper receiver in, in replacement of the bolt and uh, locks in on the lock and lugs. That takes a direct pressure off that uh, that mm-hmm. upper so you don't twist that upper at all. Okay. And I've also got the clam sh- uh, clamshell type that uh, clamps right over it. Um, either way, you've got to support that upper while you're torquing that uh, barrel nut down. And you don't have to go Dunzo Gorilla on that, that barrel nut either. You know, anywhere from 40 to 60 foot pounds is plenty. Even uh, okay. in some cases, uh, 50 foot pounds is fine. But uh, so, so know, let's you talk really want to go super tight with them. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the specialty tools you might need when you're putting together that upper receiver? We talked about the reactor rod. We talked about having the upper receiver vice block, obviously having a vice to put it in. Um, what else do you need? Uh, you're going to want to use the roll pin punches when you're doing the forward assembly. Also, that's going to help you with the uh, your, your your ejection f- uh, cover, right? Uh, what other what other kind of items do you run? Do you need a torque wrench then? Are you going to want a torque wrench? Yes. Okay. Yes. Foot pound. And again, you can get torque wrenches at Harbor Freight. You don't have to drop $150 on a torque wrench. I actually bought mine in the home section of Aldi, an Aldi grocery store of all things. They had a small like emergency car section where they were selling like, you know, little air compressor toolkit for your car. They had a torque wrench there. I actually bought it for like $29 or $25 and I've been using it for years. And uh, it's, it's, it's got calibration certification that came with it. So, you know, it's going to be on and uh, it, it works just fine. So, I mean, yeah, definitely get yourself a torque wrench anyway. Um, there's also the wheeler, um, you know, your, your, your wheeler, not foot pounds, but inch pounds, um, Torque wrench that you can get, torque wrench tool for mounting your optics and screws. You might want something like that, too, to have around if you decide to accessorize a little bit down the road. Um, Yeah. So, again, you can do the upper yourself. I would would recommend buying, you know, quality components, especially for the gas tube and the gas block. Um, What about, okay, what about actually putting the gas block on the barrel? Is that difficult to align it? Do you need any special tools to keep that gas block from moving? When you decide well, to pin it, of, I mean, what do you what do you have to do? A lot of the uh, barrels nowadays have a divot in the bottom of them, and when you slide that gas block on there, you start partially tightening one of those Allen screws on that, and just kind of wiggle that around until you feel it become free again, and then tighten it up again. That uh, that'll line those uh, Allen screws up with that barrel for your gas port. Uh, another way to do that is with uh, little plastic pins that you can acquire through Brownells. Okay. And those are slid down into place. You slide your gas block in there. Of course, that's going to leave the pin in there. But you take a cleaning rod, slide it down through there, and snap it off, and she's lined up. But that is critical. You've got to get that l- alignment with that gas block and that gas board on that barrel proper. Now, we do have a question from the YouTube side. Um, they said, what does a reaction rod do anyway? How does it work exactly? Can you guys explain what a reaction rod does when you assemble an upper? I've never heard of it, to be honest. Well, it's the rod that goes through the upper receiver, and it, it takes the place of where your bolt carrier group would go. I think you just mentioned it, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've never heard of it called that before. Uh, but, yeah, yeah that's there might be, they might call it like an upper receiver assembly up. rod. Yeah, yeah. That way you're torquing, you're, you're actually torquing the barrel nut against the uh, against the barrel extension, and you're not putting any pressure at all on that upper. Yeah, there's a lot of companies that make them. Uh, looks like there's uh, there's the Magpul. Geisley makes one. Magpul makes one. I gave one away on on uh, Patreon a couple months ago. Also, uh, I think Brownells makes one too. And yes, yeah, so you got a lot. Of, they get pretty decent ratings on them. It's one of those things that definitely it says. Makes the removal and installation of barrels, flash hiders, gas blocks, and so on, uh, basically safer. And like you said, it's going to prevent uh, excessive torque and twisting on the upper components so that you don't torque things out of whack, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Torque your barrel nuts, torque your flash. Oh, and time your flash hider. 
That's yeah, you got to make sure that all reaction rods are not created equal. Get the one that actually secures your upper receiver as well. So you have your lugs that lock on the lug barrel. But actually, you want that upper receiver locked in place too. So Geisley makes one. Midwest makes one. They're only like yeah. 20 bucks extra. They're worth it, man, because you will crush a snout. You will have that little uh, nipple on the barrel extension. It'll twist inside mm. and cut out on the thread. So spend that 20 over. bucks. So, Norman, would you recommend going Geisley or going Midwest Industries? Would those be two solid brands that people could go? Because people go buy stuff after we talk about it on these shows. Would those be two companies you'd recommend buying from? Um, Midwest, yeah, because I don't have to take off the tabs. They're a lot easier. I could just throw on, like, if somebody has their lugs, their barrel wasn't seated properly, I could throw it on my Midwest, not a problem. But the Geisley, there's these two little tabs yeah. I have to unscrew and then mm -hmm. slide it on and then station. I don't like that. If I'm doing real precise work, I'll use my Geisley rod. I got both of them. I got like five of them. But I don't like the regular reaction rods that do not secure that upper receiver because I've already crushed an AR-10 and I've crushed a 15 before. So ever since then, I just spend 20 bucks extra and get the Midwest because it's quicker. You just chuck it in the vise to slide it on and off real quick. But the yeah. Geisley is not as quick. But it does snug it in a lot tighter. Yeah, I agree. I, and I wouldn't, again, when you're going to be buying, if you're going to do a bunch of these or you know whether you're going to do more than one down the road, I just recommend getting quality tools the first time. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say go. I, any, anything I've ever bought from Midwest Industries has always been quality. It's expensive stuff, but it's American-made. It's guaranteed for life. And just buy once, cry once kind of mentality. Even if you don't, even if you buy it, use it once and you know, put it away and don't use it for another two or three years. You've got it and you're going to do it the right way the first time. So, because again, we don't want this to be a frustrating experience that kind of pushes you away from enjoying the hobby to its fullest, right? Stay away from real avid. That shit, I mean, that's garbage. Um, go with Godor, Godor punches and go with um, Chapman, Chapman screwdriver sets and all the other stuff. They're, they're pretty good. Okay, what's your take on Wheeler? Is Wheeler okay? No, I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, it's good for entry level. Entry level is cool. If you're going to do one or two jobs, yeah, that's cool. But if you're going to do this for like a hobby or you're going to do more than one, just go ahead and get the Chapmans, man. They're way better. They're lifetime warranty anytime. Any 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 of mess up, just send them in. They get fret, like brand new ones. It's it's worth it. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what told me about them. Um, AWAG, I believe, or somebody. And one of your chats had told me and put me on the Chapman. And ever since then, I got their master kit. I got their gunsmith kit. I got their mechanic kit. I got all of them now. I love them. Yeah. I mean, that's just like anything tool-wise. You can buy entry-level tools that will get you by, but they will start to wear out. There's always a possibility they can break. They're not going to be as precise. So just, you know, you spend what you're comfortable spending, but you, you, you buy quality, it's going to make for a much more enjoyable experience. And the one thing I forgot to mention, if you're going to do the an 80% lower, uh, when it comes to drilling the pilot hole or if you're going to be using a drill to do anything, we either used a corded drill to do mine or I used a like Milwaukee commercial cordless drill like you use for construction because my regular little craftsman drill, I burned through two batteries. Like I did like an entire war an entire battery just drilling the pilot hole, which is really sad to say, but it took so much torque. It literally just ate that battery up and then doing those other three little holes, it just destroyed my battery. And that's a battery that I could use to put screws in wood all day. It was crazy. It just drained it. So maybe get yourself a corded drill, the two speed cord or a variable speed corded drill. Uh, you know, if you can pick one up inexpensive, that'd be great. And that'll make it a lot easier for you. Or if you've got a good hardcore, like, you know, heavy duty cordless drill with a good battery, because you might start doing it. And then 15 minutes later, your battery dies. And then you got to wait another three hours or whatever uh, before you can continue working on that build. It's going to be frustrating for you. Um, and like I said, for the speed mill, I got the speed mill from 80% arms, which is designed for their jigs. You get the proper spacer with it. It works great. It works fine. I've done three so far and not had any problems with it. So that's something to keep in mind too. But that was just something I forgot to mention about the lowers, the drills. So if you got a little cheapo cordless drill, it's probably not going to drill the pilot hole in 30 seconds. Like they show you in the videos for 80% arms. Cause you actually have to drill, stop every five seconds, clean out the hole, put the lube in, drill again for five seconds, stop. It takes 30 or maybe 30, 35 minutes to do that pilot hole, um, especially if you don't want to rush it, don't want to cause that aluminum to melt while you're drilling it. But, I mean, everybody has their own experiences. Everybody has their own way of doing things. For you, it might be faster than others. That's so, what you get for having craftsman drills, man. 
You know, hey, I've had that drill for 15 <laughs> years. I'm already on like my third battery. I've built, we've done housework with it. We built the aluminum, you know, shed for my family member with it. Great stuff. But when you really got to do, you know, hardcore industrial stuff that requires a lot of torque, it just doesn't hold up. So that old craftsman stuff was great, man. That stuff would last forever, you know, but uh, yeah. Okay, so continue talking about the upper. So, you know, again, advantages of building your own upper receiver. You've got, you can choose the components that you put in it. You know, if you really want to make a nice high-end build with a good quality barrel, you know, the components that you need, whatever. That's the nice thing about building your own. You've got that option. And you can do it yourself without any kind of restrictions. I don't believe there's any restrictions on upper receivers. Um, it's what you attach it to at the end that makes it into the gun that you're supposed to follow for the law. Now, the second option is to get yourself a stripped... I don't go like a stripped up or minus a bolt carrier group and the charging handle, which everything's already assembled. Everything's already ready to go. Nice thing about that is you're going to get a warranty with it from the manufacturer. When you buy it, many times it's going to be lifetime. And I've had some that have had issues before, but I've never had problems with like PSA. I've had some Bear Creek ones that have had some problems before. And I've shown that off on my channel, uh, little things that have gone wrong uh, while taking it out to the range. But again, if you go that route and already have it put together, you know, it's, it's going to, it's probably going to be about the same price as buying all the parts yourself and doing it yourself, especially if you invest in the tools and you're only going to do one. So you've got that option of getting one that's stripped ready to go, yeah. or you can also get yourself one that comes with the bolt carrier group and the charging handle. So if you get it without the bolt carrier group and the charging handle, the nice thing is you can choose whatever bolt carrier group and charging handle you want. You might want something cool aftermarket. You might want to go with like the, you know, that, that, the, whatever the silver finishes that you get on those. I can't remember the name of it right now. The, the boron, nickel boron finished uh, bolt carrier groups, which are supposedly uh, easier to clean. You know, so that's one advantage of getting it stripped. You can save a little bit of money, but anymore, the way that they sell these complete packages, you really, you really don't save a whole lot. So if you're doing this just to simply get in on the cheap and you want to buy your own parts and put it together, great. But in the end, by the time you buy everything that you need, you're probably going to spend almost as much money as you already did. Now, I do recommend that you buy an upper and lower separate because if I'm not mistaken, there's a surcharge on every AR-15 that sold, if I'm not mistaken, that causes them to be what is, is is that true guys isn't there a surcharge on manufactured ars that get sold something has to be paid somewhere because that's why like a psa complete ar is actually more expensive than buying the two separate components and just putting it together yourself i don't know if there's a surcharge or they just charge that more because like when you can like the the m4 clone that i have you could buy the the two pieces separately but pre-assembled it was a hundred over a hundred dollars less than buying the actual pre assembled like a rifle all in one piece. Yeah, it's always cheaper if you buy it, especially if you can get the upper on sale or get the lower on sale and go that route. I have never had any issues with getting parts to fit together. I've mixed and matched various brands, Bear Creek with PSA. Um, I did have a radical firearms upper that had issues no matter what lower I ran it on. I don't know if it was a gas issue, what the problem was, it was a 10 and a half inch. Uh, 556 five, upper, but it was an older one from back in the day. I think Radical's quality has improved a little bit, um, but they did take care of me when I called them up. It, it, it did get resolved, so that's not an issue. Hey, um, also joining us right now, we got a little Alaskan ballistics. Alaskan, what's going on, buddy? How you doing? Hey, how's it going? Doing okay, man. It looks like it's early morning for you. What time is it where you are? It is 6.04 a.m. Man, what is that child doing up at this time of the morning? You guys going to watch cartoons or what? Um, well, no, we don't really have a TV hooked up in the house, so. Ah, good, good, good. <laughs> um, so, got, question for you. Yeah, go ahead, Alaska. I said, I got a TV for video games downstairs, but it's, yeah, covered, right. it's covered in my reloading bench stuff, though. So. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Hey, so you got a channel. I want everybody to go check it out. You got some wicked awesome ammunition tests that you do and some great uh, firearms reviews. You do a little show. What time is your show on? When can people check it out? Well, it's on 6.15-ish. Uh, it depends on what time I get home on a uh, Tuesday night, but it's 6.15-ish Alaskan Standard Time on Tuesday nights, which is 10.15 on uh, Eastern Coast Time and 9.15 Central. And okay. Right yeah. on. <laughs> uh, have you ever done your own AR builds, like like going beyond just buying pre-assembled and slapping it together with the two pins? Have you ever done your own builds at all? Absolutely. In fact, I've never had an AR-15 I didn't build. Um, okay. With the section, with the exception of like a, a Smith and Wesson M and P, um, you know, fifteen twenty two or something like that. But um, uh, yeah, I've always found it uh, easier and cheaper to to buy. Um, you know, I bought my first receiver um, when I turned 
no, before I turned 21, which I'm not sure is legal, but no, it was, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. just 21. I bought it at a gun show. I had to go through a background check on like our lying president. And, um, I just, you yeah. know, you know, I came home and told my parents I had a gun in the bag and they were like, why, you know, it was a little plastic grocery shopping oh. bag. And I was, they're like, how can you have a gun in the bag? Like, so they were, they were kind of shocked. So, uh, that was a rock river arms. I sold that one. Um, but yeah, I, I, you tend to get uh, better parts for the money. Uh, you tend to get uh, better reliable guns. Um, uh, it seems like I've always had one issue on anything I've built, but it's something oh, I, know. I, yeah. I could fix. You know, I, I'm my own warranty department on those things. And so the only one I've bought, you know, recently that's pre-assembled, if you will, was an AR-10. Um, and those get a little bit more parts interchangeability funky. Um, but as far as an AR-15, any type of changeable parts. My only issue is I have a PSA upper with an Anderson lower, and they just do not fit together that well. And the Anderson seems to be a little out of spec, and that's why people make fun of Anderson. Um, but it um, it still shoots. Like yeah. the upper receiver and lower receiver slot, a slop are bad but it still shoots extremely well. I tried to clean it up with an AccuWedge and that just made it to where if wow. I got any dirt in there, because an AccuWedge actually pushes the upper receiver and lower receiver apart. Apart to tighten it, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, so that actually started having my bolt carrier group rub on the edge of the, uh, of the buffer tube um, because it, was, it had to be pushed so far apart to get them to be tight. But I took everything out. It's loose as all get out, but it still shoots three quarters of an inch at 100 yards. So, okay. Can't. Well, you can't complain about that. Um, I've noticed with the Anderson, for me, it's always been the rear takedown pin's always been super tight. Like you have to set the gun upright, push it together, really, uh, really get it to go. And even it doesn't necessarily break in. I've, I've had that issue where I've had to literally tap it out with a punch. Um, and then, you know, I take that, I take that lower and put a, a different brand up on it. Don't have that problem at all. So to me, it's, it's been, it's been kind of a, well, Anderson's fine for me. I've, I've got the three of them and two out of three have had the tight rear pins, but I'd rather have them maybe two side and then not tight enough, but try to take it down to the field. If you have something happen, it could be a pain in the ass if you can't get that pin to come out, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so who do you go through um, Alaskan for components? Who's your who's your go-to for trigger components? Or you just buy from whoever? Are you dyed the wool fan of Bravo Company or PSA or CMMG? Who do you like to go through? Well, I've been on a budget um, uh, lots of PSA before uh, before they started overcharging for their stuff. They, uh, yeah, they're they're two to three times higher now on everything than they were six months ago. You know, absolutely, and. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame them. It's America. It's capitalism. If they can get it, you know, get the money or whatever. Um, uh, but a, um, sorry, let me set my son down. No, um, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, I, if I have a preference, I like JT distributing. Um, they're not the cheapest in the world, but they build extremely high quality stuff for, um, you know, decent price. Mm -hmm. and I had uh, I had one that I sold when I moved to Alaska, and I got another one now. And both of them with the right amp. The one I sold was a, uh, a heavy barrel um, AR-15, and it shot the tightest group I ever shot at, 0.277 inches. Good head. God. Holy crap. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I have, it was like a DMR setup. That was a 20-inch um, a heavy barrel. Uh, now I have an M4 with theirs, and it's still a group an inch at 100 yards with the red dot. You know, when when, yeah. when I do my part with the right ammo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, those guns that shoot extremely well, and never had any jamming or reliability issues out of them. Okay. Um, seem to run. It does seem to throw the brass a little weird when it's extremely cold, like negative five. So. Most people don't go shoot negative five, though. So. Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a PSA video recently with my mid length upper, and I did 25 and 50 yard red dot tests, and that was, you know, three quarters of an inch. And that was a Anderson lower, if I, I believe it was Anderson lower, and a PSA upper, and had no problems with it at all, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to the barrel quality and just that, that assembly, if you're going to free float it or not. And, and like you said, the ammo, too. I was just using, you know, an expensive 55 grain American Eagle. And had no trouble at all. And, you know, so cool. 
Speaking of which, that just reminds me, I got to take that PSA. I had somebody ask me if it'll run seal case ammo. I haven't tried that particular uh, AR with seal case ammo yet. I shouldn't have any issues, but I'm going to maybe test it out today. So um trying to think what else we said. The other option that you have, guys, and we had mentioned this before, so just buy yourself the rifle already assembled, ready to go, so that that way you don't have to mess around with it. Or again, you can buy the two separate components already assembled, low receiver, up receiver, put them together, and you've got your rifle and you're all set to go uh yeah i'm trying to think here last is there anything that we really haven't covered yet we talked about the tools we talked about the components the pros the cons we did talk about you know going the 80 percent lower route the strip lower route um i don't know is there any tools specifically alaskan that you like to use that really come in handy for for your builds with the experience that you've had oh just a torque wrench i guess would be mm -hmm. uh you know something i mean you probably already mentioned that in a receiver block yeah uh, Ice. So those are those are the the main things you need a punch and all that. You probably mentioned all that. My uh, well, my biggest component I like to have are the Smith Vortex flash hiders. Um, I'm definitely you know all of my rifles are you know crap hits the fan gun proverbial, and I like to have flash hiders instead of muzzle brakes so that you know if I'm the one having to do the ambushing, they don't see where the shot comes from immediately. Um, and those Smith, the Smith Vortex flash hiders are just tend to be the, the, the bee's knees when it comes to hiding the flash without having to buy a suppressor. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, but unfortunately, in some states, you can't have a flash hider. That's why you don't live there. <laughs> Where are my New Jersey gang at? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There I'm, you go. I'm, also, I'm also pointing at Norm's neck of the woods, too. Oh man, let's not pick on Norm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm just stating a fact. So going on on flash hiders, uh, I agree with uh, Alaskan a lot. Uh, flash hiders are the only thing that I use now, uh, unless I want to do something stupid like put a big single chamber break on a seven inch AR pistol. Uh, well, we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> no, but that, that um, thing was ridiculous. That thing was the loudest gun on the gun range when I went with it. Yep, uh, <laughs> that's the, awesome. Uh, the flash hider, I use a JP Enterprises uh, flash hider. Um, from what I've seen, uh, that is engineered to be one of the best flash hiders on the market. And they're not that expensive either. They're like 30 bucks. Now, I'm not, I'm not kidding that that gun is loud because he, there was a guy who had a loud gun. And AWAG's like, that's pretty loud. But wait till he hears this. And it was, his was super loud. Now, a couple questions for you guys real quick. I've never actually changed a compensator flash hider on an AR before. Um, with your armor's wrench and a vise, is it, is there, do you need to worry? Is there any possibility no. you can no. a barrel? No, or, it's, it's super It's easy. not going anywhere? Is it just no, takes a good amount good. of torque? Yep. And uh, cr make sure you use a crush washer. Um, the crush washer is just put enough tension on it so that, that it doesn't walk when you shoot. Yep. Ah, okay. Yep. Okay. Hey, do you guys uh, put it? Thread lock when you put your lock washer? No, no need because it's a mechanical no. device. Right? Yeah, no, you, you can, but you don't have to. It's not necessary. If anything, I use anti seize on all of the threads on an AR. Oh, that's another thing. When you're putting together an AR, especially mm -hmm. if you're assembling an upper, mm -hmm. put uh, anti seize. Put anti seize on the threads when you go to put the uh, the barrel nut on, because if you don't, that heat. <laughs> Uh, when you run the the gun, especially if you put a bunch of am a uh, bunch of rounds through it, that heat and that heat cycling will basically make it uh, make the steel. Uh, they're dissimilar metals. They're they'll essentially weld themselves to each other. Yeah, anytime, anytime you have a, sorry, go ahead. And that's where you'll need that guide leak. The, yeah, the one that locks it up both the upper and the barrel. Those are the devices that will help you unlock it. Don't do it with a regular reaction rod. You will twist it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, anytime you have a situation where you're putting aluminum and, and metal and steel together, use that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like using copper anti-seize just because it makes it makes the uh, the barrel nut go on and off a lot easier. Um, but, it, you know, as long as it's anti-seize and you have to use anti seize. Don't use oil. Don't use grease or anything. You have to use anti seize because if you use oil or grease or something, it's going to evaporate when you get that heat cycling in. 
Now, Sketchy Rule has a question out there. What about building 80% lowers? Uh, we were going to focus on the AR-15 today. I don't, Sketchy Rule, I don't know if you're talking about an 80% build that you convert into an AR pistol or if you're talking about like a, like a polymer 80 build. Um, I wasn't going to really talk about that much today because I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of knowledge on it myself. I've seen videos on it. I, I know what's involved in it, but I really can't comment much on it. But I, we can throw something out there real quick. We have a little bit of time. Do you guys want to comment at all on polymer 80 builds for Glocks? What do you need to know? What should you use? Press, Dremel, what? I mean, I know you're going to get a jig with it for drilling, and it's going to tell you exactly where to carve stuff out. Um, I've never done a polymer 80 build before, so you guys want to comment on that real quick? Um, yeah, just a uh, mill or a uh, drill press will be fine. Um, I'm going to need some good files you're going to need. Uh, uh, that's the only thing I can think of is a file or a drill press or mill uh, for a 80%, uh, like a okay. clock. You want to follow the directions. You don't want to drill through both sides from the same side. You're going to use, you're going to go in from both sides. You're going to screw up your pins. See, yeah. I can't remember. I think, I think on my 80% lowers, they, when you drill the, 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 uh, the hammer pins and trigger pins and stuff, they actually have you flip it and then make sure it's level because it's in a jig. It's not going to move yeah. and it's locked into place. So you're okay going, you don't have to drill all the way through. Especially on that polymer 80 jig, they tell you to do it because that jig's a polymer and it's just mm. not going to keep your drill bits as straight as you want to. Yeah. So if you try to drill all the way through both sides, you're going to, you're going to end up with your holes in the wrong spot. Oh, sketch, sketchy saying, I mean, since they're flying off the shelves right now, um, you know, prices on them are going to be going up. I don't know what a kit costs, like maybe 139 before you buy the parts kit. You can get um, Gen 3 Glock parts kits. There's abundant sets of them over on eBay. They haven't been banned yet, and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, some of them even come with a barrel and a slide. So, I mean, you can get, like, I think it was 159 or 169 will get you barrel slide and a complete Gen 3 Glock parts kit to finish a Palmer 80 build. So, you know, you could get into it for around $300 if you already have the tools. Uh, one second here, guys. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, again, that's, you know, when it comes to the Palmer 80 kits, I'd say get one. If you're worried about it, go ahead and get one because the price is on. We're not going to not gonna go down. I can tell you that right now. Uh, God, there's something else I was going to mention about the, the – oh, okay. Um, Here's another one, guys. Do you put red thread locking compound on the screws for your gas block when you assemble that gas block or not? Uh, never, ever ever use red Loctite on any threads that you, on a gun that you know that you're going to disassemble to clean. Even if it's the, gla the gas block, because in order to take some of the barrels off, you have to take the, ga the gas block off. So if you ever want to change the barrel or send it to a gunsmith to do it because you don't feel competent enough to change the barrel on an AR, don't use red. Always use blue or use uh, my favorite. It is called Threadmate VC3. Um, it's anti-vibration, anti-heat, but as soon as you go to break it loose, it'll break loose real easy. Um, yeah, I made the mistake of putting red Loctite on a, um, uh, what is it? It was on my Savage, my 300 Win Mag. I put it on the upper, um, the scope rail so that it would lock down real, real good. But when I went to go change the barrel out or have the, the barrel change out, I had to take that scope rail off in order to put it in the vise, and it was it, it was a bear, man. I had to put heat on it. I had to put you know, uh, you know, whenever you're taking red Loctite off of a thread for a gun, everything is heat treated for a specific reason. If you're putting like a, a torch on it to get that red Loctite to to come loose, you're changing the um, you're basically changing the type of uh, metallurgy in it because it's all heat treated and that could potentially be dangerous if you're you know like a barrel um, something that holds thousands of psi of pressure every time you pull that trigger you know I'm, I'm basically making it sound a lot worse than it probably is you're probably not going to hurt it with the heat but you know you don't want to put that risk there so that's that's my experience. Okay. I, I did use red Loctite just on the anti walk pins on my tr trigger, but if I have to change the trigger, I'm just going to snap the end of the anti walk pin off anyway. Because with the blue Loctite, they kept coming loose, and it was, it was just pissing me off. Yeah, I was, so, was going to say, you, try the Threadmate VC3. Um, I, a little bit of that stuff is probably like 
three dollars and i'm still on my my little my little tube of stuff that i have and i've had that for years so it doesn't really take much i don't use any screws i just use clamps i like to clamp on solid gas block they feel like they put a better seal on it okay. yeah uh if it's me i always run um uh, the tapered roll pins anyway Mm -hmm. the the taper pins for my front sight on my uh, m16 clone um but if it's if it's a gas block i always throw uh pins through it basically make it the, the bomb proof like how geisley likes to put it okay um oh, asking you to comment on that yeah i just have yeah. a horror story on red on red uh loctite that um this is gonna be like oh, oh boy story time yeah <laughs> It, Listen uh, and learn, children. Yeah, one of those things where you're like, "How is this guy even calling himself an, enough expert to be a, a uh, YouTuber?" Right? Um, I have a uh, Heritage Ruger, uh, a Heritage uh, Rough Rider 22. I had one. It was a 22 22 mag, and uh, one day I was shooting it, and the ejector rod assembly falls off the bottom of the gun. Very cheap 22 guns. You know how they are. Um, and so I got a new one from Heritage and decided I'll red Loctite in there so it won't fall off the gun again. Well, that day, uh, the, or the next time shooting it, I had 22 shells that wouldn't come out of the gun. So I had to press on the ejector rod really hard, and I uh, broke the handle of the ejector rod. It was cheap oh. pop metal on the ejector rod, right? Yeah. And so now I had an ejector rod assembly that I couldn't get out because I had red Loctite on it. And I eventually tried to, I had no other choice. Heat didn't work. Nothing worked. So I tried drilling it out. And now I have a hole in the barrel of a Ruger. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. A uh, Heritage Rough Rider. And it's in pieces. And I have a much better Smith & Wesson 22. Um, anyway, so um, I bought that. It was cheap at the time. And I learned my lesson on cheap guns. But I yeah. also learned my lesson on red Loctite. I could actually get another barrel and all different assemblies from heritage, but it's been more than the gun is worth. Of course. So I almost just want to sell it for parts, you know? Yeah. Somebody else could probably use or keep her up for parts. If you decide to get another one, would you recommend maybe going with a Ruger Wrangler instead of a heritage rough rider? And I don't want to change the topic of ARs, but yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. I know it's 50 bucks more, but it's maybe money well spent. You don't necessarily get the Magnum cylinder, but yeah. Yeah. It's money well spent, much better quality gun and Ruger's, um, they're, uh, Customer service is impeccable. Uh, I don't know if you saw the video they did for me, but uh, they totally replaced everything in my GP100. The cylinder, the barrel, it had been shot out. They replaced it for free because, uh, probably because I have a YouTube channel, they said they wanted to see it on the channel. Um, and I have done it, but it's, uh, they actually even yeah. said it for me in the Ruger Wrangler Bronze. So I have a GP100 oh. in Ruger Wrangler Bronze. And it oh, cool. is. Heat. It turned that gun from a channel gun that I would trade later to this little guy's uh, inheritance. So, Well, that's awesome. No, we had another Tony who's on my podcast a lot many, many years ago. He overcharged uh, some 44 Magnum that he was loading and blew his broke the frame on one of his Ruger Super Red Hawks or whatever, and or Black Hawk, one of the they two. fixed it. Yeah, he sent it into him, told him what he did. They said, send it in, we'll take care of it. And they fixed it and sent it back to him at no cost. That was even his own. That was even on hand-loaded ammunition they screwed up on. So... That was no YouTube channel connection, nada. So I think that their customer service is that good. I've On all the Ruger videos I've done, I've never had anybody complain about Ruger customer service ever. But I do know a lot of the guns don't have to get sent in. He's also, I mean, I don't hear a lot of people saying, well, this gun's finicky or I got to send this one in or that one in compared to some of the other companies that, that I've heard about. Um, so, yeah, I guess I don't have any experience with it. But still, I mean, that's that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, I just use blue Loctite uh, whenever I need something to stay in place. I always want to make sure that those threads are clean. You get all the grease off the inside of the threads and the screws before you put that Loctite on there. Because any kind of grease or oil on there is going to inhibit the ability of that Loctite to function. But um, Yeah, you use, you use, um, yeah. use rubbing alcohol. Uh, okay. Don't use acetone because that'll probably take the finish off of most everything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, use uh, use rubbing alcohol 90%. And that's basically the best degreaser that you can get for a firearm. Just make sure oh, you yeah. put the grease back uh, or it'll get rust issues or mm -hmm. uh, corrosion issues. Well, if it's going to be screws and threads, you're going to be okay. But the outside of the screw head or the surrounding area, you definitely want to make sure that you lube it up once that. Give that Loctite 24 hours to set and cure. I always do. I give it at least a day. 
uh, at least 24 hours before I take the gun back out if I use any kind of blue thread locker. Yeah. And uh, after that, it's good to go. I also use that on once I get my optics mounted. Um, I also use that on the screws for like the the, the rings for the scope itself um, so that the screws don't come loose while it's on. They're not on the mounting screws at all, but just like the screws were the for your rings that mount on your scope barrel. Yeah. Did you guys talk about um, uh, triggers at all? No, I didn't really want to get into that because that's kind of a different, a whole different kind of discussion. I mean, we can talk about it a little bit. I have some experience with it, but let's uh, let's throw it out there real quick. What what do you recommend? I mean, me, I've been using the EPT triggers from Palmetto State Armory. I feel that they're a good upgrade over the standard mil spec trigger. I yeah. have experience shooting Geisley two stage triggers, and they're great. But I don't have any other experience other than that. What do you guys want to say? Um, I I highly. Uh like geisley triggers um i mean if you can if you can afford a, a geisley trigger uh by all means buy it um because they're only going to get smoother as you shoot them and they're already really really smooth out of the box i'm running a geisley super two stage uh, in my m16 a4 i have a reveal on my channel so you can go ahead and check that out um but um yeah the geisley triggers are really nice um hyper fire is really nice uh, Timney is really nice. Some of the Palmetto State Armory uh, offerings are really nice. Um, honestly, don't don't buy the cheapest trigger out there because odds are you're going to end up hating it. Whereas, you know, if you get something Geisley, you can at least get your money back if you don't like it. Yeah, I mean, you would definitely buy from a quality company. Some of these, you could be looking at two, three, four hundred dollars for an aftermarket trigger. Yeah. Um, now, what about light primer strikes? Is that an issue with these aftermarket triggers? Because you're going with like a three and a half pound pull or two and a half pound pull on your trigger. I've Are they offsetting never, that by using a weaker hammer spring or what? I've I've never really had that issue because I used uh, JP Enterprises like three pound uh, trigger <laughs> spring kit, which is absurdly light. Um, if you are going to run a lighter uh, firing pin, or uh, sorry, a lighter um, mm -hmm. a lighter trigger weight. Uh, replace the firing pin with uh, with a titanium one, uh, just for the simple fact that it's stronger than steel, it's lighter than steel, and it'll last a ton longer. Um, I think Palmetto State Armory has their titanium firing pins for like twelve bucks. Um, oh, wow. That'll that'll reduce your um, you know when you charge the AR rifle, um, that firing pin is free floated, so it's going to impact that um, that primer when it charges. So if you run around in a uh, in an AR and then you quick pull the bolt and you pull that live round out, it's going to have a little dimple on it, like uh, the firing pin tapped it. Uh, so the the titanium firing pins reduce the size of that impact, um, and most of the time they're a lot easier to clean too. Um, it's definitely a good investment if you're going to want something that's good, the proverbial go to war gun. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, there's going to be a few parts you might want to think about swapping out. Definitely those the trigger pins or the uh, the firing pins. Uh, yeah, Laskin, what do you want to say? Well, uh, I have experience with some cheaper triggers, and uh, as uh, AWAG just said, you're better off spending the money on Geisley. Uh, my wife for Christmas brought me an AIM surplus trigger, 99 bucks for like a three and a half pound trigger, right? And um, it's it's decent, like it's not bad, but it's got creep, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, once you get to that wall, it's good, but there's a little bit of cre creep to it. And I also had a one and a half pound uh, JP Enterprises trigger. And it, uh, it also um, had a lot of creep. It was a $139 trigger like seven years ago or two now, but um, it had a, a lot of creep. But, uh, you know, it's one and a half pounds. Having a lot of creep is probably a good idea, especially since I use it as a hunting gun and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you're going to not get the Christmas uh, if you spend less money on a trigger. And if you buy a trigger assembly that's all in one, it's not a separate hammer and, mm -hmm. um, you know, trigger assembly there, you are going to have to um, uh, get anti-walk pins. Um, uh. generally, speaking, they, they, generally speaking, the regular pins don't get held in by the trigger. Okay. And the, the other thing I want to say about triggers is you can get the $10 spring kit and lighten just a, a, a regular mil spec trigger 
And I've not had any issues with that. It helps just a little bit instead of like an eight or six or five pound trigger, you can mm -hmm. get it in the four pound range. And that's plenty good enough for most people to be able to shoot accurately. Um, you can also actually, there's several videos on YouTube on how to do it. You can actually bend the springs you have and sand down a surface of the hammer and get that, that trigger to be actually really nice with a mil spec. And I've done that. But once you do the spring kit and the, um, or the mil spec spring bend, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is like a 20 minute trigger job. Yeah. You, you do have to worry a little bit about hard military primers. I had, uh, some, um, uh, tracer rounds that wouldn't go off and some M855 ball. I had just one occasionally out of a hundred, you'd hit that thing. Uh, you could hit it again and it would go off, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So you do have to worry about that, but with a Geisley or something nice, AWAC is correct, but spend the money on triggers. Does anybody here on the panel, there's a question from the, uh, the YouTube side. How about trigger tech? Anybody have any experience with trigger track, trigger tech aftermarket triggers? I've heard of them. I've heard good things about them. Uh, I haven't put my hands on them yet. Um, I'm actually thinking about building an AR-10 that uses a trigger tech trigger just to play around with it. Um, but, you know, it's it's lukewarm. Another brand I wanted to mention here that I don't think we've heard of yet. Uh, CMC, CMC triggers. You guys have any experience with them at all? CMC is good. Um, okay. Their, their drop-ins are good, but like like it said, uh, like Alaska said, is uh, use anti-walks. Um, definitely get a good set of anti-walks. Strike Industries. CMC actually makes their own anti-walks. My mm -hmm. personal favorite is the KNS anti-walk pins. Um, but, you know, anti-walks are anti-walks. So, you know, whatever works. Well, no, I'm not going to say it because I've been reading reviews on cheap ones and a lot of them snap because they make them out of a crappy metal. They can't handle the force of repeated use in an AR-15. So the pins, because they're hollow, because you've got the threads in there for the screws, if they're not a good enough metal, they can break if you buy cheap ones. That's why I didn't just order a set of any walk pins off of Amazon for five bucks. I started reading the views and like everybody was complaining about them breaking. So you might want to make sure you buy from a major manufacturer. Right? So CNT triggers, uh, the pastor of my church of all people, people has one in his AR-15 and uh, Christmas trigger I've ever felt. Uh, but CM, CMC, CMC, yeah. CMC, CMC, yeah, it was yeah, okay. Incredible. I would, I would buy. That's what I'm looking at putting in my next ARs. To be honest, I don't know. They're sure. They about 179 bucks. Is that kind of what you're looking at for a buy-in? Are they 200? They're about 200 dollars, aren't they? Um, I've seen them on sale at Palmetto State. You'll uh, occasionally Palmetto State will have them on sale for like 139. Okay, now I'm looking at their uh, at their website right now. Single stage, two stage, AK lead triggers, color triggers, Glock triggers, Glock barrels, AR pin sets, CMC gear. Yeah, it looks like they make a lot of uh, really cool different. Uh, would you guys recommend going single stage or two stage for an AR-15? What do you recommend? It depends on what you're doing. Um, personally, when I built my M16A4 clone, uh, I ran a Geisley Super Two Stage just for the simple fact that two stages allows you to it's it's a really short once you get that first stage out of the way it's just short and then it just breaks real real clean um you know whereas if you take the travel of a single stage you're you're traveling that more before it breaks and with the two stage you're right at that wall as soon as it stops on the second stage mm -hmm. um yeah you know, is but that lends itself to a lot more accurate firing um whereas a single stage is more you know speed friendly yeah, yeah, it's definitely going to be moving for the competition route, possibly, I'm thinking, uh, especially if you go super light. But, yeah, so, again, I guess that's just another. It says, okay, how about PSA triggers? Um, I've Again, I've upgraded. I've been Every time I've been buying a build kit off a of PSA, I've been buying it with the EPT trigger. Basically, it's almost like a nickel boron coating on a few of the components. And what I've noticed is that instead of having that little bit of creep in that wall and that break on, like, a mil spec trigger, which is totally fine. Mil spec triggers are fine. Uh, this has more of like an equal tension across the board until it breaks. It just feels tighter, in my opinion, because it's almost yeah. like there's a coating on the components and the hammer. And I, I really like it. It was a definite change for me at the range. And that mid-link uh, test that I did, this guy right here that has the EPT trigger in it, um, I honestly had to kind of adjust what I was used to because I was so used to my old Bear Creek Arsenal M4 that had you know a little bit of cr gritty creep and then hits the wall and then it would break. This was more like a tension and then just goes off. But um, I think it's worth the upgrade. I think it's worth the try. I mean, 
The EPT triggers are 10 or 20 bucks more, I think, when you buy a kit. If you get a lower parts kit, you don't even notice it because many times you get it with the furniture and all the components you need for a lower build. And that's pretty much how I've been doing it too. Um, M. Gabriel says PSA has a three and a half pound single stage for 119, I think. Oh, might be yeah, something to test out too. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at those CNC ones. They've got a couple that are $300, but they include the whole hammer. You know, you get the entire package all in one, drop it in and it's done. Um, so you might be you might be dropping some some money on one of these, but again, I fired the the guy used some of the guys with triggers before the two stage, and they are really nice. I think they personally I think they help out with accuracy a little bit. You know, we're talking fine bench testing though, but in real world use, I think your mill spec trigger is going to be just fine. So, hey uh, Squib, I think we got you back here. Did you want to comment at all about building ARs? Any any kind of words of wisdom you could give us or? Anything you want to share maybe with any of the ARs you've ever put together? Any situations you've run into or any mistakes you've ever made in the past? Uh, have a roll of painter's tape. That yeah. will help yeah. you avoid scratches. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have a whole lot of really fancy, expensive tools. It, oh. You can make regular tools work. I mean, if, if you're already into doing repair work on other things, you probably already got everything you need. Uh, I would say that something to consider is look at the climate, not just the political climate, but also the economic climate. And you can make a, a decision to purchase a, uh, a bare lower or an assembled lower and then any upper you want that'll, that'll mate to it based off of that especially if you don't have a whole lot of experience with ARs you you know even if you've never owned one maybe you've shot some other people's ARs but that might give you an idea of what you like or what you don't like before you make that purchase if you if you have no experience you're probably better off getting one that's assembled or putting one together and seeing if you like it and then whatever changes you want to make you make on your next one or you make to that one or what have you but there's there's a time where fully assembled rifles are not available or they're way overpriced. Earlier in the show, you were talking about the price of uh, a bear lower. Mm -hmm. And I bought my first bear lower during the assault weapons ban. And I paid $200 for it. The reason it cost so much is it was a pre-ban lower. And that was, you know, the going rate at the time. Now, you might look at a, a bare lower today and go, it's a $40 part, blah, blah, blah. That's because when you came into it, they were $40. If you came into it 25 years ago, they weren't. So you'd have it. It's like the cost of fuel. People are going, oh, my goodness, fuel's going up. It's like, do you guys remember paying five bucks a gallon? We're still not there yet. So I think it's a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I was not about to pay $1,200 for it. It is not a $1,200 rifle. An AR-15 is not a $1,200 rifle. And that's what they were going for with all the neutered features on there. So you could buy a pre-band lower and a kit without having everything taking off of it and put the whole thing together for about $400, $500 at the most. And that's, I decided to go ahead and do that. So I was legal. I didn't pay that ridiculous price for it and they were available. If, if you're out there looking for a complete rifle, and you can't find one, start looking at stripped or complete lowers and kits and uppers. And you might be surprised. Or if you are looking at rifles and, and you're like me, you're going, this is not a $1,200 gun. I'm not paying this much. Look at what it would cost to put one together. You might be surprised that you've got more options because there may only be a couple complete rifles that you can find at the at a particular time or at your local or however you you know, everybody buys differently. Some people won't buy online. Some people always buy online, whatever it is. You don't want to pay a transfer fee, whatever the problem, you know, or whatever the, the your, your particular choices are, you might be able to buy a lower and an upper and a few parts and put something together with not a lot of effort, not a lot of expense, and you might end up with a better deal and you might end up happier in the long run. Plus, you're going to learn a little bit more about how to maintain your rifle 
the mm-hmm. more assembly you do. Even if you slap the upper and lower, I know people who don't know even know how to pop the pins loose to break the gun down shotgun style. <laughs> you know, this forces you to learn how to do that. And there's lots of people that there are old tricks to it, and they think you need special tools for this and special tools. You don't. You really don't. It, some of these tools help, and I, I, there's a lot of people out there with all these bad experiences. I hear you guys keep talking about these anti-walk pins. I've never used an anti-walk pin ever, ever. So, you know, and the other thing, too, is it's just like anything else. The more you take it apart, the more it's going to break in. But the more you change stuff out that wasn't meant to be changed out on a regular basis, the more wear you're going to put on it as well. So sometimes when you buy that bear lower and you drop in that overpriced two stage trigger that you want to spend all that money on. And that's the trigger that's staying in there. You don't have to worry about slop or anything else because you're not taking it in and putting it at, you know, back and forth and back and forth. That's a, that's a component that was not meant to be taken out every other week. So there's just, there's things like that to consider as far as availability expense and how much effort you're willing to put into it. Yeah. Also, these things are machines. So these are built to have a certain amount of wear built into them. You can buy used parts. You can buy used bolts. You can use buy used, uh, you know, barrels. There's nothing wrong with a used barrel. Um, you know, the barrel that I'm using right now uh, on my M16A4 is literally a beat to death Palmetto State Armory 20 inch barrel, and it it shoots the daylights out. Like I have no idea how many rounds are on that barrel, but you know, it shoots the daylights out. Yeah, just talking about, you know, convenience and stuff. I know we're not talking about builds right now, but we kind of are if you're buying the completely assembled components. Right now, I just went over to PSA for the heck of it. They've got a simple, the classic stealth lower for $229, which is about 100 bucks more than it was a year ago. Uh, but for 20 bucks more for $249, you can get the complete lower with the EPT trigger, the Magpul furniture already installed. Now, granted, you're going to have probably 20 bucks for shipping. You're going to have an FFL transfer fee. So you might as well say that's going to put you at $300 once you get it home after sales tax. Uh, then you can go over to like Bear Creek Arsenal. You can get yourself an upper for $300 and they're like $10 for shipping, 15 bucks for shipping. So you're looking at about 600 before you add a magazine, flip up sites or an optic, which is a lot better than some of the prices I'm seeing right now. Cause I'm seeing things like, you know, like the, the Ruger AR is going for 800, the Smith and Wesson's MP sports are going for, you know, and they, they might be a superior gun. I don't know. Those are going for eight or 900. You're seeing AR is going for a thousand. Um, I'd say you could get into something for 600. If you already got some parts floating around sites, magazines, anything else you want to add on to the, to the AR, you don't necessarily have to count that as an extra expense either. So that's, you know, that's, if you go get it pre-assembled, ready to go, it's more convenient. But like what Squibble is saying, when you go build it yourself, you really do learn about the intricacies of the firearm, how it functions, you know, like Alaskan said, you're your own warranty repair division, right? You can fix it yourself if something happens. And if you put it together, you're probably going to know what broke and you're going to be able to take care of it when something happens. It's not hard to figure out, but understand these people. There are people out there that don't want to work on these things that don't understand how they work. So that just simply don't want to mess with it. So yeah, DD. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, you know, kind of what you're talking about but you talked about earlier like like selling your parts if you upgrade i don't but also if you get into this like i literally i have enough parts i need a 20 dollar mm-hmm. oops kit and an upper and i could throw a i could throw an ar together for less than 350 dollars if i needed to yeah oh yeah, um, so yeah if, you, I, keep, if yeah. you keep those parts you have them handy i also mm-hmm. wanted to i didn't say it earlier because mm-hmm. everybody else wasn't on but since squib already said it if you're just going to build one or two lowers you don't necessarily have to get all those special tools like the punches. Like when I put mine together, he mentioned the, the painter's tape. I'll put that on the upper where I'm going to tap on the tap a hammer in and I'll use a set of pliers to start that rope and I'll squid and do it. I mean, if I was going to build a bunch of them, invest the tools, but if you're just going to build your first one, see if you like it, I wouldn't, if you don't already have the tools, I wouldn't go and invest in all those tools just for a lower, get them, get well, them, I mean, you get can, them, you, get you them, can get a lot more. Set. You can get a roll pin punch set and a starter punch punch set for 20 bucks. I mean, to me, yeah. the time it would save and the frustration of not collapsing that pin, oh, you don't have a spare. Now what are you going to do? Go spend $12 and go get a couple of them delivered to you, you know? Well, I'm just saying, just... Those, at a minimum, I would get the punch sets if you're going to assemble your own lower or do your own upper. But that's it. That's the only thing I would say that really makes life a lot easier. And that's yeah. just because I've done them without, and it's a pain in the butt. But if you're careful and you know your tools, you can make it work. But I would just say go the... 
get yourself an inexpensive starter punch and a, I mean, a lot of people already have those anyway. So yeah, I'm just saying yeah. for the first person who's going to see if they want yeah. to do it. it yeah. if, if you don't, if you don't want to invest 20 to $50 in specialty tools, mm -hmm. try it that way. If you scratch it, you paint it, whatever. Uh, but yeah. it, it's still a way to get into it. Sure. True. Uh, the last you can one. use a bird's AC touch up pin to, to deal with the scratches. And I literally put my first AR 15 together with a military issue armor's manual I bought at the gun show for under $10, I think. And I used three tools, a hammer, a punch, and a pair of channel locks. Seriously. Yep. And I'm yep. not saying that that's the only way to do it, but if, yeah. like, like defense guy was saying, you're only going to build one or two, you're building your first one, you're just not sure. Now, I will say having those tools helps, especially if you build a lot of them. And who... Who doesn't want to have a decent set of tools? I mean, I've got a box that's specifically for gunsmithing, and yeah. it's good to have all that yeah. stuff together. It's a time Enjoy. saver. You don't put as many scratches and gouges and stuff, but that's something that comes over time. It's like building uppers, right? That you know, there there's a, a lot of tools that you can use to to make building the upper better, and that's something where you've got to weigh out. Is it worth spending the money? Am I only going to build one or do I think that I might build more at a later point or mm -hmm. do some gunsmith work? So you got to weigh it out financially. Each person is different. Well, and I will say if you're going to do what I said, you're, you're going to be someone who already has some mechanical tools. If you can't, if you can't put a nail on the wall without getting a diagram, get the specialty tools. It's going to make your life easier. Okay. Uh, Alaskan, you had your hand up on that. You have a question. Um, what you were going to say, yeah. Well, I wanted to to reiterate what uh, I think Squib said. I got my first lower during the first assault weapons ban, and it was 119 bucks for just a regular lower, not even uh, pre ban or anything like that. So they were more expensive, and they've come down over the years. And um, you know, when I did my 5,000 sub giveaway, I, I bought like three lowers for or five lowers for 30 bucks each. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah definitely crazy the other thing i want to say is like building your own ar and this is totally changing the subject it's the mm -hmm. best way to get caliber change so if you want a hunting caliber like 6.5 grindle or 6.8 sbc2 uh caliber you, you can realistically hunt deer with um you know I, i've killed plenty of deer with 223 next shot brainstem but uh if you want to switch calibers or you want like a 458 socom Building is really the only way to go. Um, there are much more quality parts that way. You're not having to, you know, you're going to save a lot of money on different calibers because they those are charged a lot more in the store when you can find them. So, yeah, I never thought about that too. That's another part of it. Yeah, and, and you know, there might you might not be able to affordably get an AR chambered in the caliber that you want pre-assembled because they're charging kind of a premium because that caliber, you know, once you start to get away from 5.56, you might pay more. 7.62 by 39, 5.56, the uppers are relatively expensive. Once you start to get into 6.5 anything, you know, 2.43, right? I mean, some of those are very, very expensive as a complete rifle, but if you do it yourself, you know, you're going to be sitting in good shape, so, yeah. Yeah, you want to talk about one that'll really make you wonder is 50 Beowulf. Every time I've I've looked at that since they come out with it, I've walked away from it going, nope, nope, sorry, it ain't worth it. Alexander Arms is they're they're total jerks about their whole proprietary thing, and then you get into the whole ammo thing and the reloading thing and all that, and that's one of those calibers that it's like I'd love to have this, but you guys, I, I'm just you're not getting my money, nope. So I built a 500, uh, 500 Beowulf. That actually sounds cooler than a 50 Beowulf. 500 um, Beowulf, yeah. Um, I built a 50 Beowulf for one of my buddies in New Jersey. Um, and that thing, it's a, it's punishing, man. It like The recoil on that thing is, is absurd. Uh, it's a little unnecessary. It's a little uh, excessive. Um, but the... The 50 Beowulf is, it's a fun cartridge. It, it puts the hurt down range, but it also puts the hurt in your shoulder. And I'm but, somebody who loves recoil, so. Yeah. Hey, but but Squib, the 50 but Beowulf is the only caliber in stock right now when I go to the gun store. It's it's all I can get, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, is, originally yeah. I thought the 450 Bushmaster was a little bit niche and overpriced and not enough people were making it, and then that thing, it sort of broadened out. You started getting more ammunition. You started getting more uh, companies making uh, the, the, the uppers. 
things like that. <laughs> and uh, I shot one and I said, all right, yeah, this is, this, it's manageable and things are a lot more, con- that's another thing too. You know, if they come up with a new caliber or only one company's making that caliber and you want it really bad, you're the one that's, you're, you're like the one, the person buying the latest, greatest electronic device. Everybody else is going to buy it a couple of years later when the price comes down or when more companies are making it. So mm-hmm. you're kind of paving the way for everybody else. Sometimes yeah, that's, that's a good thing and sometimes it's, it's not. You just have to take that chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is, we got the, uh, the godfather of AR 15 building with us over in the comments over there in YouTube. We got dead horse out there. Uh, dead horse says a quality barrel, like Saturn, Saturn or Douglas or white Oak and a match that made it upper and lower are worth its weight in gold. One ragged hole versus a one to two inch group. Only you can decide if it's worth the extra cost. That's words of wisdom right there, man. I mean, you can definitely, you can definitely, you can buy some accuracy to a point. I do agree with you on that. Um, especially if it's, Precision made it, honed. It's designed to be put together like that, matched and made it. Yeah, it's really hard to beat that. All right. X Adam one says, I never see 50 barrel with the local stores ever. No, I agree totally. There's just some weird calibers that I see in stock at our local shields that I don't even know what you shoot them through. So there's some just some odd calibers popping up. But uh anywho. Yeah, they got some nine by twenty one right now if you want that. I don't even know is what that, you get that out of. Isn't that called is it called Lungo or nine by isn't it nine millimeter Lungo or Longo? There's, I don't there's know, something. But they have a sign right on it that says not nine millimeter Luger. Not nine by nineteen. What do you shoot nine by twenty one? Can somebody help me out here? I'm sure it's something there's obvious. Actually, but... I think there's you're a... thinking about the Largo. Nine Largo? millimeter Largo. Yeah. They there's have also... a bunch of that in stock at Shields right now, but they put a big sign on to let people know it's not for the regular nine millimeters. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you can uh, the nine millimeter IMI is also a nine by twenty one. The Israeli military industries caliber that they tried to create. So there's that, and there's also a nine by twenty three Dylan. So there's also some cool stuff. What I was going to say about the fifty Beowulf is mm-hmm. yes, the recoil is intense, but it's a lot better than a grizzly bear chewing on your shoulder. I'm just saying. Oh yeah, it's got its purpose. I mean, don't get me wrong; it definitely has. A, or if you need to crack an engine block at a at a patrol stop, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I understand yeah, that. With the, with the bear thing up there in Alaska, you could probably justify the price more than I can in Michigan. And that's another thing. You know, it's it's not just how much do you make; it's what are you using it for. For somebody, for for somebody in your position, you're probably always thinking about four legged threats. Definitely. And it's uh, my bug out rifle currently is a five, five, six. And I'm thinking, you know, there's been instances where people have headshot grizzly bears and got it done. But, um, you know, it, they weren't using 55 grain V max or M one ninety three or something that's going to shred its jacket. That's for sure. Um, so I think, you know, the people have done it have been using Barnes all copper or M eight fifty five ball or something like that. So. Let's see. X Adam one says back to triggers. I use a CMC 3.5 pound flat trigger. Most of my AR is relatively inexpensive, simple drop and no issues and clean look. Yeah. Uh, Dead horse was talking about the, the components and the parts. He says that none of the guys shooting F class with sub $600 factory ARs are shooting six inches and under groups when they have $600 barrels and a $600 receiver set, then they shoot sub six inch groups. And he says F class is 600 yards with 223 FYI. If anybody's wondering why I say six inch groups. So. Oh, cool. My J2 distributing kit that I had was a, you know, a $500 kit with an H bar with a good, a good Colt Shaw barrel in it. And it would shoot uh, two and a half inches at 500 yards all day long with the right ammo. Um, even in the wind where the wind was starting to blow it, my buddy was shooting and the wind was picking up as he was shooting. And you'd see two bullets half inch away from each other, one on top, one on bottom. And then the wind would pick up and there'd be a two more one on top, one on bottom, just a few inches over, and you know, two more just a few inches over as the wind was picking up. So you can get it done with some good quality components for sure, but it doesn't have to be like an $800 barrel and an $800 receiver set. But if you're going to go max route, absolutely do that. But you can get some good accuracy out of decent quality if you you know hand load for it or find good ammo for it, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was with a cheap knife on scope. Oh, wow. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. All right. 
Well, uh, guys, we're going on almost two hours here. I think we're going to go ahead and call it. I'm going to go ahead and start my day here. So again, we've talked about the basics of the build for the AR-15. We covered the tools, the components. Should you go 80% strip versus complete? Uh, lowers, also them uppers. We talked about going strip versus complete versus building your own, the pros and the cons. I'm sure we could spend all day talking about it, but uh, we're going to go ahead and end it here. So I want to thank everybody for watching today. Let's let the panel go ahead and uh, give us their outros, give us their plugs. We'll give a little shout out to people watching on the YouTube side and we will get going. So single shot, we'll start off with you. Um, anything you want to say before we go? Well, thanks for the invite. Always appreciate yeah. it. Always have no a problem. good time uh, chatting with you fellas. Pick up a, a few bits and pieces of information that I didn't know before. So that's always good. Um, keep an eye on the channel. I do have some new equipment at the house. I'm going to be doing some reviews on it. So uh, give a look at that if you would. If you uh, like what you see, give, give us a like, share, and uh, subscribe to the channel. America moves by truck, folks. Take care. Have a great day. She's a pretty day out here so far. Oh, yeah. Now, and single shot, I always, after every caliber corner, I've been getting an email or I've been getting a message or a comment on the video saying, I can't find single shot's channel. It's single space shot, exclamation point. Yep, that's right, right? Put that exclamation point right after the T and capitalize both S's. You got it. That's right. That's right. Okay, uh, Squibby, anything to say before we go? No, uh, put it together, build it from scratch, buy it complete, do whatever. But if you don't have one, look into getting one. If the prices seem to be too high right now, you got to kind of roll the dice. If you get it now, it might be higher later or it might be more difficult to get later. If you don't get it now, a year from now, prices could come back down, availability could go back up, and then you're the one laughing all the way to the bank it's it's something that's gone up and down for decades it's gone up and down since the early 90s and i think it's going to continue to do that so putting one together or building one is not it's not a bad option for for like what defense said said you know somebody who's mechanically inclined already has the tools or or is willing to put the time into it so just don't rule that out don't rule that out don't sell yourself short but if it's just not your thing, then just consider weigh weigh out the the risks. It's it's almost like an investment. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy I bought into mine when I did. <laughs> the age of free shipping, and I got in before Nebraska had required sales tax on internet purchases and all that fun stuff. So I and I still buy stuff now. I'm still buying uppers and parts kits, and I'm paying probably one to two hundred dollars more than I would have. But part of it is, you know, I'm I'm just enjoying the shooting, and I'm just doing it. Uh, kind of paying the piper at this point, but uh, that's just kind of the climate, like you said. So, all right. Uh, Defense Dad, anything you want to say before we go? I think it was a good discussion. Um, had a lot of fun. Uh, if anybody's not subscribed to anybody in the panel, they all got good content. Um, yeah, that's about it. Cool, cool. All right, man. Appreciate you being here. Make sure you guys check out Defense Dad's channel, too. So, all right. AWAG, anything to say before we go? Sorry about that. Uh, no, it's all good, man. Go ahead. I, was, no, I usually give you guys time to find the mute button. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, just do your do your research on parts. Um, if you need more um, more help with specific parts or brands, when it comes to brands of, like, complete rifles, you know, the, Travis, you seem to know a lot more about uh, complete rifles than I do about parts, you know. Okay. So, like, you're you're a good resource for complete rifles. I'm a good resource for small parts. So, if you need help with anything, feel free to email either of yeah. us. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I got I got my YouTube channel. I've been trying to re uh, review little pieces, parts here and there. Um, so, check out my channel. Check out Travis's channel. Um, as a, uh, again, thanks for the invite. I always appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely, man. Appreciate having you here and having your knowledge and your experience. All you guys that joined in, I appreciate all the help. It's not a, a topic I'd want to tackle all by myself because I, there's some things I don't know and there's some things that I haven't done yet. So, so I was glad to have all you guys here today. And uh, last but not least, Alaskan Ballistics. Alaskan Ballistics. Anything you want to say before we go, buddy? Well, thanks for having me on and sending yeah. me an invite. And, uh, you know, sorry for the baby in the background who's making noise. But it's all good. Uh, 
he's already got an AR too. He just doesn't know it yet and a couple of guns. So that's all that matters. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say if you need an AR, you need to get one because the government says you shouldn't have one. That for, therefore means you need one. And oh, yeah, absolutely. For yeah. the Second Amendment, go call your senators, your, uh, your representatives, call them, uh, let them know that it's, uh, you know, it's a, a very big priority that we be able to keep our guns because the moment we can't and uh, then you don't get to keep the rest of your rights either. And um, no, no right is absolute is what the president said. So uh, he's absolutely wrong on that. So make sure that, you know, your your you know, things are going to go up for a while. You know, hopefully you're not paying twenty five hundred dollars for a PSA or a DPMS or something like it was in the Sandy Hook thing. But if you don't need one, if you don't have one, you need one. And, you know, look into getting that, look into, you know, collecting the ammo as you can and the components to reload it as you can mm -hmm. find the parts. So you need that uh, on my channel. I do barrel length tests and chronograph and stuff like that. So if you want to know what barrel length to get, that's basically what what I do. So appreciate it, Travis. Yeah. And uh, thanks for another yeah. good discussion. Cool, man. Appreciate having you here. That's awesome. In Alaska, last thing, when is your show on? So people, and we know we talked about the beginning, anybody joined us late, when can they check out your podcast? Uh, my podcast uh, is Tuesday nights at um, 6.15 Alaskan time, 10.15 Eastern-ish, depending on what time I get home from work. And uh, then I have a new uh, actual video every Wednesday morning. So Cool. You too? <laughs> I do the same thing. I try to, at least when I can, but yeah, yeah. All right. So there you go. A lot of good content to wake up to on a Wednesday morning. What better way to start your hump day than starting out with some awesome content on YouTube from us. So cool. Uh, little little shout out to New York Outcast out there. He says that no AR is complete without a display stand, display stand from rnldisplays.com. So make sure you guys check out rnldisplays.com. Check out their AR-15 display stands. And uh, there's, they're really cool to have around. It's kind of fun just to be able to put them out and show them off. And I've got a couple more of them sitting over on the side over there. So we'll be giving one of those away for my Patreon drawing uh, for the month of April. Don't know when that's going to happen yet. Uh, it may happen this weekend. I've got a crazy busy weekend coming up. Or it might just happen early next week. I might do it before one of the big podcasts. We'll just go live. Also on my B channel, check out my B channel, Coffee, Computers, and More. And on the B channel, we're going to be doing a coffee giveaway because I, I passed uh, 3,000 subscribers on the B channel about a month ago. I just haven't had a chance to have the drawing. And I ordered from a local coffee shop in Nebraska that's a little ways away. I actually bought some items from them that I'm going to give away in the drawing. So we're going to do a live drawing over on the B channel. Uh, again, that's coffee computers and more. Check it out. I do coffee reviews, food reviews, technology videos over there. That's just kind of my non-firearms channel. I just have fun with that channel too. And uh, and that's it. So otherwise, guys, um, then again, shout out to SS Pond for all their support over the years. Uh, this is Travis P11. I want to thank everybody for watching. We should be back next Saturday at 8 a.m. and we'll get another another topic out there. If anybody ever has ideas for topics, just go ahead and email me at thecalibercorner@gmail.com, and uh, we will definitely have an, ep an episode on that topic. If we haven't had one for a while, I like to go back and revisit topics that we've already discussed. You know, because uh, times change and things change, especially when it comes to prices. So let's see. Joining us on the YouTube side was New York Outcast, Scott79, Bernie B. Sanchez, Defense Dad, JH586, a typical Jake out there. Uh, let's see. DJ Play Nice in the house. David Ramirez has been watching. Uh, X Adam1, Dead Horse with us. Again, the godfather of AR 15 builds. Um, Algier Solha was out there also. Solja was out there also. Uh, let's see who else was joining us here. A lot of conversation going on over there. Sketchy Rolls watching today, too. Justin Grimm. Uh, let's see. M. Gabriel watching. If I miss anybody, I do apologize. Guys, we're chatty today. Jason Jay's out there. And if I miss anybody, I want to apologize. I think we had, yeah, Two Gun Kitty, the Catnip Outlaw was with us. Probably some tacos and french fries floating around out there, too. Kevin June watching us today, too. Kevin, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And I think we'll go ahead and call it that. So Michigan boy was watching too. So I'm Patriot in the dark. All right. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it. Have fun. Be safe. As you know, we will talk to you soon. Uh, get out there, go to the range, do some shooting and have a good time. And if you ever have any questions or comments, just make sure you email me and we'll take care of you. All right, guys, take care. Have a great Saturday. Bye-bye. Bye, Felicia. Bye, Felicia. Adios.